just maximize it uh very good evening today we are going to organize a webinar from delhi orthopedics pg training on behalf of ortho tv this is dr sansaloda welcome to ortho uh, online education webinar from ortho tv we would like to thank all of our faculty for sharing their knowledge and uh, we wish you a safe and healthy uh, lockdown period we wish all our audience and healthy and safe days ahead and we hope all these webinars add value to your time these webinars are dependent on internet speed it might be at times unstable please bear with us for any issues on internet today we have a uh, academic grants from uh, uh, the zadas people nicoxia people so they making this uh, uh, nicoxia nicoxia mr nicoxia mr 8 the 720 pnsp so now i hand over to manish dhawan sir to start the webinar good evening everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, doa pg training program and uh, this uh, today's webinar is on peripheral nerve injuries it's a very very you know uh, popular program in ortho tv and a uh, lot of requests were there to have this webinar so i welcome uh, dr anil dhal uh, uh dr kotwal dr pankaj jindal dr vinit dabas and dr ajit uh, shankaran i also thank uh, uh, i also thank dr uh, ashok sham dr shamshul hoda dr ravi chohan uh, for the technical support and i now request dr uh, sharad agarwal president doa to please uh, introduce dr dhal uh, and uh, then dr dhal will introduce the other thank you. dr sharad agarwal please thank you dr manish good afternoon friends i welcome you all to the post graduate teaching program of delhi orthopedic association today's theme is peripheral nerve injuries many thanks to professor anil dhawal dhal and the whole eminent faculty for preparing and participating in this webinar today the subject of peripheral nerve injury is not only important for post graduates every orthopedic surgeon has to face this challenge frequently whenever uh, uh, managing trauma or joint replacement even any other electrical work, elect electric work all in all is this webinar shall be great learning revision and update for all of us my special thanks to dr manish dr shamshul huda dr sham for working hard behind the doors to make doa webinars a huge success it's my pleasure to introduce professor anil dhawal who is instrumental in organizing today's webinar though i am sure he needs no introduction he is an eminent orthopedic surgeon of delhi and a hugely respected teacher Presently, he is professor of orthopedics at uh, ESIC Medical College, Faridabad. Previously, he was director and professor and head of the department of orthopedics at Maulana Azad Medical College, New Delhi. Uh, also, previously, he was head orthopedics University of Delhi. Had been a member of the ethics committee of Medical Council of India. He had been past chairman Animal Ethics Committee, Maulana Azad Medical College, New Delhi. and past chairman of hand cells action of iua now i request dr anil dal to proceed further to uh, take the proceedings further dr dal please yeah good morning uh, please allow me to share the screen uh, somebody has to give me permission to access Dr Ravi yes sir yeah uh, you give him permission yes, yes. you can share sir yeah i can i can share now now it's okay so uh, very good afternoon all the participants i am very happy to know that uh, delhi orthopedic association is holding these uh, training programs for post graduate students and i uh, am uh, very impressed that peripheral nerve injuries has been kept as uh, one of the teaching programs for the post graduate students uh well this could have uh, couldn't have been timed better since uh, in the setting of the covid 19 pandemic already the exams have been delayed and this probably is the right time for the post graduate students especially the exam going batch to be able to sort of uh, get a 
final shine on whatever knowledge they have got and it would be the endeavor of the august faculty who are going to be presenting uh, their topics here uh, that all the students are benefited to the maximum well to start the show i it is my pleasant duty to introduce my colleagues on the program and first and foremost is someone who is the senior most amongst us uh, dr prakash kothwal uh, has been a very good friend and uh, he is one person who has not aged as far as his appearance is concerned he has been uh, heading the department of orthopedics at the prestigious all india institute of medical sciences uh, he obtained his uh, training in in traumatology in west germany and he was trained in hand surgery at the famous kleinert institute in louisville kentucky apart from that he has published a lot of uh, prominent papers in in various journals of international repute he has been an, a member of the academic council of uh, the bhagwat dayal sharma university of health sciences he has been an eo trustee from 2010 to 2015 and the list goes on so uh, i welcome him and uh, i uh, uh, he would be speaking to us on the topic of ulnar and median nerve injuries the next in the line is dr pankaj jindal again a very eminent hand surgeon in maharashtra he practices at the pune hand surgery institute uh, and he is a convener of uh, one of the most popular national instructional course in hand surgery where he uh, conducts the course for about 3 days annually again he has been extensively trained abroad and uh, in france as well as uh, at the kleinert institute uh, in the us uh, he is going to talk to us on the topic of paralytic hand today and predominantly concerning the peripheral nerve injuries the next is another young dynamic associate professor at the molana azad medical college dr vineet dabas not only was he a graduate and post graduate from molana azad medical college but he has also become a faculty member there and he is one of those few faculty members who is keenly interested in hand surgery and he is also extensively trained abroad both at singapore at the national university hospital in singapore and he has done a fellowship in hand surgery for a year in calgary canada uh, he would be speaking to us on the radial nerve injuries today which incidentally was also one of uh, the topics of his research while he was doing his thesis last but not the least dr ajish shankaran is another orthopedic surgeon trained at the molana azad medical college and thereafter at the ganga uh, hospital in coimbatore from where he jumped on to uh, the kleinert institute of hand surgery in us and he is now back serving his own people in uh, kerala at the al shifa medical uh, at the institute of uh, medical sciences al shifa in kerala well uh, this is uh, the panel of experts which uh, we would be having and dr ajish is going to speak to us on nerve injuries of the lower extremity as well as he will Uh, tell the post graduates the nuances of examining a brachial plexus injury case well as the introduction 
of the faculty is comes to a conclusion, I uh, would take the liberty of proceeding with my topic today, which happens to be uh, an approach to the short case, a short case of peripheral nerve injury, which every uh, postgraduate student must practice to present uh, in the examination uh, after learning how to examine it correctly. Well, being a short case, uh, uh, you will agree with me that the time at hand in the examination is barely 10 minutes. And in these 10 minutes, you have to do a lot uh, of groundwork to be able to present your nerve injury case adequately. So we always insist that history should not be very elaborate as far as a short case is concerned, but I have listed these four points as the most pertinent questions to be asked in history or to elicit history on these four points. So the first and foremost is like in all other upper extremity cases, uh, is the dominant hand involved or is it the non-dominant one? Because we all know that the de functional demands of the dominant hand are far greater than the non-dominant one. When did the injury occur? So this gives us the time elapsed since injury, because again, one of the most important factors for the final outcome of a peripheral nerve repair surgery is the, the injury to re, uh, reconstruction or repair time. As the time increases, the chances of an optimum result are declining. Next is how did the injury occur, meaning thereby what was the mechanism of injury? And we will soon come to what is the importance of this. And last but not the least, what treatment has been given till now? Remember, majority of the patients presenting to our public hospitals, which are usually the centers for post graduate examination. In these centers, our patients usually come to us on a delayed basis, sometimes weeks, sometimes months later, and some sort of a treatment may have been accorded, which may be in the form of a simple skin suturing after debridma without repairing the nerve, or it may be in some sort of a splintage which has been provided to prevent contractures. And one needs to know what has happened to this patient since the time of injury. Mechanism of injury is important to know because it determines the type, management, and prognosis of nerve injury. To give you an example, the traction type of injuries, which are typically seen in the high-speed motorcycle accidents where a patient or the rider, when he falls, the head strikes against the curb or the road, and there is a sudden increase in the neck shoulder angle, which causes a traction type of an insult on the underlying brachial plexus. And different components of the brachial plexus may undergo a varying force of traction and thereby some portions may be completely torn, whereas the others may suffer a lesion in continuity, something like a neuropraxia or an exanatomesis. And that is why this sort of an injury has been labeled as a type five injury, a type six injury of Mackinnon and Dillon. Contusion is a blunt force creating a nerve injury typically seen in a close fracture of the shaft of the humerus, which on deflection of the fractured fragments can hit the neighboring radial nerve and it can cause an injury. But these injuries are typically recovering type of lesions, given a, a sufficient period of time, spontaneous recovery is known to occur. So therefore, when you are dealing with a close fracture of the shaft of the humerus with the radial nerve palsy, never uh, uh, offer in the examination 
exploration and repair as the first option. Always it is better to wait for recovery to occur spontaneously and how it is calculated will again realize during the course of the lecture. Compression neuropathies are self-explanatory, typically seen in carpal tunnel syndrome where the median nerve is compressed or Guyens canal where the ulnar nerve is compressed or the cubital tunnel where the ulnar nerve may be compressed. So these injuries usually are partial type of injuries. They can recover on their own if tackled on an early area uh, or, or on an early basis simply by releasing the compression. Lastly, we have laceration which leaves a clear cut line of action. A glass cut injury on the wrist creating a median or a combined median and ulnar nerve deficit complete in the hand is nothing but a neurotomatic injury, a complete disruption of the injury. And unless you repair this injury or repair the nerve, no recovery is going to occur. So I repeat, mechanism determines the type, management and prognosis of nerve injury. As far as the examination is concerned, I feel in the case of a peripheral nerve injury case, the postgraduate student or the surgeon needs to act like a detective. He, as per the classical recommendations in a short case, you have to inspect, you have to palpate, but we call it look, feel and move. So the detective work which uh, the postgraduate student is supposed to do is ultimately leading to the fact that at the end of the examination when he is presenting the case, he has to have a clear cut decision on what is the nerve which is involved. Is it a high or a low nerve injury? Is it complete or incomplete? In Seddon's classification, where does it fit in? Is it a neuropraxia, exonotomesis, or neurotomesis? Is it a recovering lesion or a non-recovering lesion? And last but not the least, how will you manage this patient? Meaning thereby, what investigations you will offer and what is the treatment which would be most suited in this situation? The caveat here is that this is a one-time examination. In OPD follow-ups, you have the benefit of seeing the patient of a peripheral nerve injury coming to you on a monthly basis and that timely or repeated examination gives you a lot of benefit because it, it, it gives you an idea whether the patient is recovering or not. So this one-time examination can be tricky, but if you know the nuances of this examination, you will be able to decide all these listed factors which are most important for a peripheral nerve injury case. Well, as far as how to decide which is the nerve involved? Well, as having been an examiner for quite a few years, I've always taken care to keep a simple single nerve injury case in the exam because we do not want to confuse the candidate in the exam, but you may get uh, multiple nerve injury case also, but here we will start or we will talk to you about what happens or how you select the nerve which is involved. Well, the site of injury is important to note. Identify the attitude. Some injuries have a typical attitude uh, like the foot drop in a, in a lower extremity sciatic nerve or a common peroneal nerve injury and based on these two factors, the site and the attitude, you get a clue, you get a clue to what are the specific tests to be performed in this likely nerve injury. And obviously, the, an exhaustive neurological examination concerning both the motor power assessment and the sensory assessment uh, have to be performed before you can pinpoint which nerve is involved. To give you an example, this young man presented to us with a blade wire injury six months ago 
and the treatment which was already according to him was a simple depridma and stitching at the primary center that he built. So it's a V-shaped incision mark, healed probably primarily, and he has a typical attitude which we call as a wrist drop. And it is the left non-dominant hand of this patient which is involved and uh, the attitude does not give us a very, very conclusive clue. So we asked the patient to try and dorsiflex. And he was unable to dorsiflex. And at the same time, he's unable to open the digits in extension also. So there is a loss of active wrist and digital extension. And if you look at the typical location of this, it is on the outer aspect at the junction of the proximal two thirds and distal one third of the arm here. The only nerve which is lying in this area is the radial nerve. The other two nerves, the median and the ulnar nerve are no way here. They are on the medial side. So this has to be, this gives you a clue that it is a radial nerve involvement. And uh, is it high or low? That is the next question. And in all nerve injuries, to decipher between high and low, first and foremost is the site. If the site is at the elbow or above the elbow, then usually it is known as a high injury. And if it is below the elbow, maybe at the wrist, it is known as a low injury. Apart from the site, there is some sort of an index musculature which needs to be checked. And the index musculature in this particular case happens to be the brachioradialis. And always, we always tell the candidate first test on the normal side. So if you have to test the brachioradialis on the normal side, you ask the patient to hold the forearm in mid prone position, elbow flex to almost 90 degrees, and the examiner should apply some sort of a resistance at the wrist level and this is how the test is performed. And you can see the bulge of the brachioradialis beautifully seen on the normal side. And after the normal side, you go on to the affected side, perform the same maneuver. And what you find that there is no contraction. There is no contraction. And once you find that there is no contraction, it is always better. And it is always better to palpate the belly of the palpate the belly somewhere here to be able to say that there is no contraction and only then you can say that the brachioradialis is MRC grade zero. So there is no motor contraction here. And next in the line here, well, uh, just to tell you as far as the median nerve and the ulnar nerve are concerned, if it is a high median nerve injury, the typical attitude would be pointing index finger. I'm sure Dr. Kothwal will elaborate on it, but just to give you a, a bird's eye view, as far as the ulnar nerve is concerned, we have the typical ulnar claw, which is less prominent in the high lesion than the low lesion because of the phenomenon of ulnar nerve paradox. Well, we move on to decide whether it is a complete or an incomplete lesion. Well, a complete lesion means that all the muscles supplied distal to the site of injury are paralyzed. So we need to test the other wrist extensors now and on actively asking the patient to try and dorsiflex the wrist. What happens is there is a semblance of if you, if, you, if you look at it again, in the initial phase, there is a flexion of the digits and it is followed by slight amount of extension at the wrist. Please watch this. Watch this happening. So there is an initial jerk at the wrist in the direction of dorsiflexion. Please do not get carried away by this as sign of activity in the wrist extensors. This is a trick movement, which is triggered by the tenodesis effect of the flexor group of muscles. And they create a passive sort of an extension of the wrist. And this 
should be detected as a trick movement. And if you want to confirm, always palpate the, the muscle belly at this level, proximal forearm level, to be able to say that there is no contraction. The dictum here is analysis of movement is not analysis of muscle power. You must remember this. And to complete the muscles supplied by the radial nerve, the next in line is the extensor pollicis longus. And the patient is unable to extend the thumb, but he's trying to, to move it sideways in an attempt to some sort of a do a, uh, some, some sort of a trick movement he's trying to do. So extensor policy longus is also paralyzed in this case. And last but not the least, the extensor digitorum communis and the extensor indices proprius need to be tested. And here the hand is passively held in dorsiflexion, again to avoid the tenodesis effect, which may cause some sort of a trick extension of the digits. So this is how the patient is asked to actively extend the digits. He is unable to do. Neurological examination would be incomplete without doing a sensory examination. And since this is a radial nerve case, the sensory supply is in the first web space dorsal aspect. Always compare with the normal side. Uh, if you ask the patient, uh, by just testing on the affected side, dorsal aspect, he will always say, yes, he can, he can feel. Because by the visual effect also, he does volunteer that he can feel. But the moment you compare with the identical area on the normal side, he will always tell you, though he can feel, there is a large amount of difference between the magnitude of the two feelings, and there is definitely a decreased feeling on the affected side. Well, where does this lesion fit in as far as the sudden classification is concerned? Six months down the line, there is no contraction in the brachioradialis. There is, a, is, there is an incised wound at the outer aspect of the arm. This can only be due to a neurotomatic lesion. It can only be a neurotomatic lesion and neuropraxia and exonotomesis are out of question in this particular patient. And it is also pertinent to remember or revise again that closed fractures anywhere in the body usually cause lesions in continuity, predominantly neuropraxia or exonotomesis. And open fractures have the propensity to cause neurotomatic lesions. So in this particular patient, there was no fracture. It was uh, an open injury caused by a sharp blade wire. So we labeled it as a neurotomesis. Is it recovering or not recovering? Well, we must remember that neuropraxia and exonotomesis, though they have recovery potential, but the recovery profile is absolutely different. As far as the neuropraxia is concerned, it, the, these lesions usually recover within six weeks at sometimes within hours, sometimes within days, but definitely within six weeks time. And the, the, the beautiful thing is here that there is a simultaneous recovery in all groups of muscles. Whereas recovery in exonotomesis is long drawn and the proximal muscle supplied by the nerve after the site of injury is the first to recover followed by the next in line and so on. And this is known as the phenomenon of motor march, which is proceeding proximal to distal uh, in line. Well, neurotomesis does not have the ability to recover on its own and it will only recover if a repair is performed and then it will follow the recovery pattern as in exonotomesis like the phenomenon of motor march. As far as uh, the phenomena following nerve injury are concerned, the moment there is a transaction of the nerve, the distal segment of the nerve undergoes Wallerian degeneration, which is essentially removal of debris. It is a scavenging phenomenon which occurs in the first month following injury. And thereafter, if there is a lesion in continuity or a repair has already has been done, 
an epineural repair has been performed. The axonal sprouting will occur at the rate of one millimeter per day. And this is what is responsible for a sign known as the tinnel sign, which has the ability to monitor sensory recovery. It is monitoring only sensory recovery. You percuss the nerve along the course of the nerve from distal to proximal. And at one particular point, if the patient tells you that there is a there's an electric current like sensation progressing distally into the sensory distribution of the nerve, then that is the point where tinnel sign is positive. And this positive signal sign, when examined one month later on follow-up, should have moved by about an inch. So if it is progressing at that rate, there is a satisfactory recovery occurring. And this should be in tandem with the motor recovery. And how do we monitor the motor recovery? This is as per recommendation of the sedan where he explained in a shaft lecture of the shaft of the humerus by drawing this diagram that you calculate the distance between the probable site of uh, injury or fracture till the site of sensory innervation or a motor innervation of the brachioradialis muscle. So if this distance happens to be about 16 centimeters, then it is going to be 160 days because recovery is occurring at the rate of one millimeter per day. And do not remember to add 30 days or one month of Valerian degeneration to this calculation of 160 days because during Valerian degeneration, no recovery occurs. Well, what is the, how do, what, is, what was the diagnosis in the case which I demonstrated to you? So it was a high radial nerve injury. And on questioning, when the examiner questions you, is it a complete or incomplete, it is a complete one. It is a neurotomatic lesion as per sedan. And there are, in spite of six months having elapsed, since there is no recovery in the brachioradialis, it is, it is a non-recovering lesion. And it is affecting the non-dominant hand. So as far as the management of this scenario is concerned, it is nothing else but you need to explore and repair the radial nerve and try to either repair it or put a nerve graft, whatever the given situation is. Well, this patient came to the OPD and he just showed his hand and he said that there has been a progressive weakness with paresthesia in the little finger and the ring finger over the last one year. The deformity is on the other side, it is gradually increasing. And on questioning him, he said he has sustained no recent injury. Well, looking at the hand, uh, there is intermetacarpal wasting, which is probably due to the dorsal interosseous wasting. Uh, the first web space on the dorsal aspect is severely wasted. Uh, signifying wasting of the first dorsal interosseous as well as the adductor pollicis muscle hair. And uh, there is a, some sem semblance of a ulnar sided claw deformity. Well, uh, on, on uh, looking at the sensory part, there was a sensory deficit in the little finger and half of the ring finger, ulnar half, and the, all the tests of ulnar nerve uh, paralysis like the Froman sign, the card test were positive. So a diagnosis of an ulnar nerve injury was made, but we needed to identify what is the cause and the various causes which came to our mind were, is it a Guyan's canal compression because there's no injury? Are we dealing with a Hansen's disease or is it a thoracic outlet syndrome? And here comes a very important lesson to the candidate, never examine the hand in isolation and always insist on proximal limb exposure and examination. So in this case, it was mandatory to palpate the nerve behind the medial epicondyle. So when we just lifted the sleeve, what we found was there is a cubitus valgus deformity. It was a cubicus, cubitus valgus deformity. And on closer questioning, it was revealed by the parent of the child, of, the, of, the, of this uh, man. He said, that my parents told me, I had some injury in the elbow when I was four years old. 
So this made us examine the lateral aspect of this elbow and we found that there was uh, the lateral condyle was mobile, there was a crepitus, there was a varus and valgus instability and on the x-ray revealed that there was a non-union of the lateral condyle with a cubitus valgus deformity and this became the diagnosis just became crystal clear that we are dealing with nothing else. It's not Hansen's, though the ulnar nerve was thickened behind the medial epicondyle, but it was a tardy ulnar nerve paralysis. And the treatment here is anterior transposition of the ulnar nerve. And on exploration, you can see the normal ulnar nerve, the thickened ulnar nerve due to the recurrent micro trauma creating fibrotic response. And this is how it was transposed, uh, preserving the branch to the flexor carpi ulnaris, which was weak in this particular patient. Well, similarly, a median nerve injury can present with a wasting of the thinner muscles, inability of the hand or the thumb to abduct at right angles to the plane of the palm, as is seen in the normal hand. The left is the normal hand, the dominant right hand was the affected hand. And along with this, there is demonstrable uh, paralysis of the thinner muscles. But one must keep in mind the possibility of anomalous innervation from the ulnar side. And some of these patients, in spite of having a glass cut injury at the wrist, are able to have some sort of a opposition or satisfactory opposition. So one needs to be aware of the anomalous innervation in hand. And obviously the sensory supply of the hand by the median nerve is very important because it supplies the pinch area of the hand. Well, this is a test, a deep test, which is a screening test. This is uh, usually uh, a test where you are not suspecting a nerve injury, but you want to quickly rule out all the three nerves being intact. So this test, by virtue of the fact that the patient is able to dorsiflex the wrist hair, uh, the radial nerve is intact. The flexion of the metacarpophalangeal joint, extension of the interphalangeal joint, tells you that the ulnar nerve is intact. And opposition of the thumb tells you that the median nerve function is intact. So this is beak as the beak of a bird. When we talked about investigations and uh, we have electrodiagnostic studies, which cannot be covered in total in this, uh, in this uh, uh, sort of a program. But you need to know that the predominantly there are two modalities. One, the nerve conduction velocity, where sensory and motor velocity both are tested. And the second one is a standard needle insertion EMG, where we should know that the candidate needs to know that a biphasic and, and triphasic action potentials are normal. They suggest normal innervated muscle. Fibrillation potentials are typically seen in a denervated muscle and polyphasic action potentials are the ones which are seen or which indicate a re innervation by a recovering nerve paralysis. The flip side is that electrodiagnosis do not have the ability to decipher Exonotomesis, which is the lesion in continuity, can recover on its own from neurotomesis, which will require repair. So that is the drawback, but it does help predominantly in recognition of the nerve injury and detection of recovery and monitoring its progress. How do we treat nerve injuries? If you are suspecting a lesion in continuity, just wait and watch at the rate of one millimeter per day, expect progression and keep on doing muscle testing of the proximal most muscle supplied by that nerve at monthly intervals. If, it, if you are suspecting a neurotomesis, explore and repair. During the waiting, in the waiting period, if you are waiting for recovery after repair or if you are suspecting an exonotomatic lesion and you are waiting for recovery to occur, you need to provide some sort of a splintage to prevent any fixed deformity from de developing. If the sensory area is important, as in the median and the ulnar nerve, avoid thermal and mechanical injury. The hand needs to be protected. 
and mobilization of the supple to just to keep the joints supple. And last but not the least, galvanic stimulation because neuromuscular junction tends to degenerate if the, it is not stimulated. And this is the most important interface between the nerve and the muscle. And if this is degenerated, the, even a recovered nerve will not be able to produce function in the muscle. Depending on the nerve repair timing, it can be primary if it is performed within the first 24 hours, typically done in clean incised wounds. It may be a delayed primary done uh, between 8 and 14 days and secondary if it is done any time after two weeks. The important point to be remembered is that since majority of our patients present late, remember that if a patient is presenting to you after one year broadly, especially if it, has, if it happens to be a high injury, then motor recovery should not be promised to this patient. However, for the purposes of sensory recovery, especially in the median nerve situation, even repair is, can be done up to or after two years, simply for sensory recovery being also important. Well, to show you uh, a case uh, here, glass cut injury at the risk, three months old patient, three months old injury. There was a loss of opponent's function, wasting of the thinner muscles and loss of sensory sensation in the radial three and a half digits. Uh, the injury was detected and uh, there was a fibrous tissue formation between the proximal and the distal ends. The ends were freshened and funicular appearance was, was first identified and only then an epineurial end-to-end -end suturing was performed with the wrist in flexion. And this patient had a good functional recovery in due course of time. Well, all patients may not be so lucky as a gunshot injury patient who presented to us as uh, with the inability to extend the digits, though he could extend the wrist. So it was diagnosed as a posterior interosseous nerve paralysis. Since we were expecting a neurotomatic lesion, we explored and we found that after resection of neuroma and glioma, there was only a one inch gap, but this gap could not be overcome by any means because the nerve divides distally into several branches like a cord equina and the branching nerve becomes less mobile. So the sura nerve can be harvested in such situations uh, as the gold standard of overcoming gaps today is a nerve graft surgery. And this is placed as multiple strands across the gap. And this is known, therefore, as a cable graft, just like the three wires in a cable in the household wiring. And since the distance to be traveled here was small, this patient within four months had recovery of digital extension as well as thumb extension. Well, once recovery starts, you need to see to it or while you are waiting for recovery, we have already talked about galvanic stimulation of paralyzed muscles, but the, you must remember that once muscle starts getting innervated, muscle strengthening exercises need to be reinstituted. And when sensation starts coming back, sensory re-education is another very important area which needs to be performed by the occupational therapist. The patient has to be taught all over again, what is hot, what is cold, what is blunt, what is sharp, and so on. So sensory re-education is equally important in these patients. What to expect after a nerve repair surgery? Well, this is dependent on several factors. First and foremost, what is the type of nerve which has been repaired? Is it a purely motor or sensory nerve, or it is a mixed nerve? If it is a mixed nerve, there is a, always a chance of motor to sensory and sensory to motor anastomosis due to a sort of a rotational malalignment and result is likely to be suboptimal. Whereas a pure motor nerve like the radial nerve would have a better result than the median nerve or the ulnar nerve. Level of injury, the more distal the level of injury, the better the, 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 the motor as well as the sensory recovery. 
initial wound condition, if the wound condition on day one was a clean incised wound, primary repair was possible, the chances of recovery or the quality of recovery is likely to be much better. On the other hand, if the wound was contaminated, there was a lot of uh, devitalized tissue, one had to debride and just do skin suturing and the wound was fit enough for nerve exploration only a month later, then obviously the result is going to be suboptimal. Last but not the least, age of the patient. Children have tremendous regenerative ability and apart from that, the, since the limbs are still growing, the size of the patient is small. The distance to be traveled by regenerating axons is smaller than in an adult. And along with that, neural plasticity in the brain provides the child patient with almost normal results after a well done peripheral nerve repair. Last example, a digital nerve cut just at the base of the index finger and a simple epineural suturing performed. It is a pure sensory nerve, distance to be traveled is small and this within three months, the patient has good sensory recovery in these patients. With the best of techniques of nerve repair available, there will always be some failures or there will be those lesions which are irreparable. You find, you explore a lesion and you find that it is irreparable because there is extensive damage to a segment of the nerve and you will have to put on very, very large graft, maybe in excess of about 10 centimeters. And in these cases, you can decide to straight away go in for what is known as a reconstructive procedure in the form of tendon transfer procedures. Well, postgraduate students, I want to leave you with this a favorite uh, painting, a slide of a painting, which shows uh, Hippocrates relying on the art of palpation and clinical diagnosis to diagnose what is wrong with this patient. And this is what you should be able to practice the art of clinically diagnosing uh, orthopedic diseases and especially peripheral nerve injuries and not rely on sophisticated investigations which can be misleading at times. Thank you very much and three cheers for Delhi Orthopedic Association. Thank you, Dr. Dahl. Uh, doc, uh, Dr. Kothwal, you can be ready with your presentation. Dr. Dhal, can you stop screen share? There is a question from the audience. Can I ask you, sir? Yes, yes, sure. Uh, when to plan for nerve repair and when to go for tendon transfer? Any duration? Well, uh, the, uh, the answer lies in customization. Actually, you can never uh, have a cookbook type of a recipe. But the dictum is that if your patient is presenting within reasonable time and you feel that a neurotemesis is the lesion which needs a repair, uh, if, it is, if, the, if the injury is less than one year's time, especially if it is a low lesion, one should try to repair the nerve in the first instance because it is said that uh, if, the, if the muscles are re innervated one gets an independent control of individual muscles, which is not possible with any type of tendon transfer. So tendon transfers should be kept uh, at, as, a, as, a, as a sort of a salvage procedure in those cases where a nerve repair surgery either is not possible or it has failed. I think uh, this would have been a reasonable answer to the person who has asked it. Thank you, sir. And any other uh, question from Dr. the Dr. panelists? Dr. Dhawan, can I ask a question? Yes, yes sure. 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 Sir, sure, uh, sure. Dr. Dhawan, excellent, exhaustive talk. My question is, in a relatively recent injury, suppose patient presents at, the, uh, at four to six weeks of injury, yes. uh, besides history, uh, do we have any method to find out the, uh, the, the what kind of, is it a continuity injury or is it discontinuity injury, exonatomesis or neurotomesis at that stage and or what advice we give to the patient to wait for till some feature appears or we go immediately and do something? 
Uh, well, uh, uh, we have recently uh, been using high frequency ultrasonography for uh, sort of a detecting the lesion in these nerves. And this is most successful for nerves which are not very deep seated. So we have not had very good results with the sciatic nerve, but as far as the median nerve and the ulnar nerve, especially in the forearm and the wrist is concerned, the ultrasonologists are able to pinpoint whether we are dealing with a neurotomesis type of a situation or at times, is it a lesion in continuity? Is it a sort of a neuroma in continuity? And uh, the accuracy has been to the extent that when, you, when we have compared the site which was declared in centimeters by the ultrasonologist, it almost matches with the surgical exposure. So high frequency ultrasound is another very important tool which has recently come into the armamentarium of the orthopedic surgeon and it should be exploited. MR neurography was also, uh, is also available, but you need very, very sophisticated and expensive coils. Every MR center will not have those coils. These coils are highly de dedicated for MR neurography and only then you can, you can uh, uh, have a good idea of uh, what is happening to the nerve. So I think uh, ultrasonography is a better option in these scenarios. So do you think it should be a protocol? Suppose a patient comes with a recent injury and you go for an ultrasound and depend your decision on that? Uh, I would, uh, you see, I was in an academic uh, setup, so it was a learning experience. There was a thesis going on. So every case we were subjecting it to ultrasonography. But I personally feel if you are in a, in a private setup and you want to keep the expense to the patient low, then you can reserve these investigations only for those patients where there is a doubt. You see, a, 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 a glass cut injury, for example, at the wrist, uh, does not need an ultrasonography to say that it is a neurotemesis. If there is a complete cessation of conduction beyond the wrist, uh, say for the median nerve, there is complete motor paralysis, there is sensory loss, I think uh, there is no need for any, any investigation here. You can straight away at four to six weeks time, uh, as the patient presents, go in for an exploration and you will uh, almost always find a transaction type of injury. Uh, Dr. Dhal, uh, there is a, another question from the audience. Yes, what should yes. be done in case of radial nerve palsy during close reduction of humerus shaft fracture and casting? Should we explore or wait? Very good. I think uh, uh, this question uh, is, uh, it has been asked, which is very important because we are living in a world where everything has to be fixed today by surgical techniques. And, uh, but it is so interesting that in my entire career, if there has been a fresh fracture of the shaft of the humerus with the radial nerve paralysis in a close fracture scenario, I have never operated on this patient. I have treated the fracture by closed methods and I've treated the nerve injury also by an expectant attitude. And I have found that the humerus fracture unites by conservative method. And even if the nerve does not recover six months, seven months later, if you have to explore the nerve, at least you do not have to do anything for the shaft of the humerus. So this is, I think, uh, it is since it is rare to find a neurotomesis type of uh, injury, with a close fracture and the protocols of management are designed on generali generalizations and not rarities. I think the standard dictum should be treat both the fracture as well as the radial nerve injury by conservative methods. Sir, I think it, another concern is if it occurs while uh, doing the reduction or while applying the plaster, then patient develops the uh, palsy, then do what? Uh, well, Holstein and Lewis uh, was, the, was, the, was the group which described this uh, type of injury. But uh, over the last decade or two, there have been other investigators who have, uh, uh, 
who have and uh, the number of cases in Holstein and Lewis uh, uh, series was just six to seven patients, and he had operated on all. Whereas larger series are now suggesting that even Holstein and Lewis fractures can be treated conservatively, and even post reduction palsies can be treated conservatively initially, and majority of them recover. Well, this is a gray zone. Okay. This is clearly a gray zone, and here uh, there is a divided opinion, even in standard textbooks. If you look at Campbell's orthopedics or Green's orthopedics, there is a division, and the and the authors of the chapter have said that in our experience, we would like to operate upon a secondary palsy. If after reduction of the shaft of the humerus, there is a palsy occurring they would like to operate. But as I said, there is literature available today to support a conservative treatment also. And when you operate, you obviously fix the fracture first, and then uh, you identify what the lesion is. The nerve is caught between the fracture, you release it. If it is damaged, you would like to repair it. Uh, Dr. Dhal, uh, there is another question. Which investigation is better, NCV or EMG, which can be done first? Well, uh, when you send the patient to an electrophysiologist, it is a standard dictum that both have to be done. Both have to be done because each one of them is giving a different type of an information and it is the subtotal of the information which is then analyzed and then a report is formed. But it is, but it is quite obvious that if you are dealing with a compression neuropathy, if you are dealing with a carpal tunnel syndrome type of a situation, there, nerve conduction, velocity, both motor and sensory are important. And majority of these cases in the initial phase, sensory, nerve conduction, velocity may be normal. So, and EMG has the capability of telling you whether the muscle is getting paralyzed or not. So, abductor pollicis brevis, EMG is equally important. So, I think uh, rather than saying which one is more important, it is, I would say, both have to be done and you have to look at what is happening to that data and how it is uh, to be correlated with the clinical situation. Only then you can make a complete interpretation of the same. So both okay. are equally important. Okay, Dr. Dhal, uh, I'll, now we will uh, basically allow Dr. Kothwal and we'll take questions later on. Over to Vineet Debas to invite Dr. Kothwal. Dr. Vineet, are you back? Yeah, uh, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Kothwal to start with his talk. Uh, uh, please uh, take over. Oh, okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I would like to thank the organizers of the Daily Orbe Association and specifically Dr. Sharad Agrawal, uh, Dr. Manish Dhawan, and Professor Anil Dhal for giving me an opportunity to participate in this seminar and uh, I mean the webinar and talk on the injuries. Again, the important uh, this thing. Uh, the ulnar and the medial nerve injuries. I'm not going forward. Something problem. Can you see my? Okay, right. Uh, of course, uh, I, actually, I often say that uh, when more than one people speak on the same topic, there is bound to be repetition. So, number one, we are with it, and particularly, it is also uh, an advantage for this uh, for the postgraduates because there will be some repetition, which is actually would be important for them. And Dr. Dhal has uh, the excellent lecture that he has given, has made things easy for me. So I can certainly skip some of my sli slides, you know, which actually he has already talked about. So these are the causes of uh, nerve injury. However, I would also like to mention, and he has also done that, that the compression neuropathy is also one of the causes, actually is not exactly injury, but the patient will have definitely pain and maybe at times uh, paralysis of uh, that particular nerve. Uh, in the diagnosis, it is important to, uh, to know the site of the injury. The, there are susceptible sites like the nerves close to a bone at the ulnar nerve. You have the, and the ulnar nerve at the elbow and the radial nerve in the arm. He has shown a very beautiful case on that. Then there are closed spaces, particularly the carpal tunnel, which will have the uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. And then the structures of the adjacent ones, like the median nerve uh, is close to the brachial artery. So if there is an injury of the brachial artery, then you can also suspect 
that the patient may be having an injury to the to the nerve as well and also the order you should know in which the branches are given by a particular nerve as this traverses from the proximal to the distal so that will give you an idea as to what nerve must be paralyzed and how to test for it in the diagnosis uh, the you there are certain things like you said look feel and and move so the, in the look you have to have the look for the site of the scar if there is any one then the trophic ulcers uh, the skin whether it is there is smoothness or dryness of the skin and whether there are any circulatory changes or temperature changes in that particular extremity distal to the injury on inspection you can also see that there are particularly sometimes there are tapering of the fingertips due to the loss of the subcutaneous tissue so this is also an important finding uh, actually in the diagnosis of a of a nerve injury then the characteristics postures uh, ideal nerve you already seen uh, will lead to a wrist drop and the ulnar nerve injury will lead to a claw hand so here the diagnosis is actually it's a spot diagnosis then the characteristics postures you also have a median now you will have a uh, vesting of the thinner muscles and an adducted thumb so it's called as an ape thumb whereas there is an a combined median and ulnar nerve palsy that means you are seeing here there is parallel there is vesting of the thinner and the hypothenar muscle as well and then there is a look at the adducted uh, thumb and uh, so this actually is called as a simian hand the alteration of the contour you can see here there is uh, definitely the muscle a mass between the tendons is uh, gone the, the atrophied so this is actually uh, in the because of the vesting of the introsia in a, in an ulnar nerve injury and uh, this is the loss of muscle bulk so because of which which what happens that the bones appear prominent because the the bones which are normally masked by the muscle mass that the muscle mass is atrophied so the bones look more prominent in the motor assessment one must test all the major muscles uh, in by the uh, supplied by the particular nerve in the limb the selective muscle testing should not be done and for example in the median nerve you should be able to test all these uh, major muscles pronator teres uh, flexor carpi radialis pronator quadratus and so on and so forth so, the, so that will actually give you the localization as to the what is the level of the injury if at all uh that the patient has so testing for the pronator teres what you need to do is the elbow should be in 30 degree of flexion and and uh, ask the patient to pronate and you resist the pronation so the muscle that becomes prominent here is the pronator teres so this is how you can test uh, the integrity of the pronator teres the another muscle supplied by the median nerve is the pronator quadratus so what you do is you ask the patient to completely flex the elbow and then ask him to pronate and this pronation is being done by the pronator quadratus because here now because of the flexion of the elbow the muscle the pronator teres has been knocked off then there are these various tests you know the pen test this by which we are testing the integrity of the abductor pollicis brevis then you have the pointing index uh, finger test you know because there is paralysis of both the flexors here supplied by the median now the patient will not be able to flex it completely then you test for the uh, flexor pollicis longus and the flexor carpi radialis and uh, this uh, against resistance when the patient is asked to flex the wrist you can uh, feel or see the um uh, muscle if it is intact otherwise the patient will not be able to do that the opposition uh, also the patient is asked to do the movement of opposition and uh, if there is a median nerve paralysis he will not be able to do that and you can also see this is of course a patient with leprosy but you can see there is so much of wasting of the thinner muscles and the patient is not able to perform the uh, movement of opposition then you test the uh, actions of the flexor digitorum superficialis and the flexor digitorum profundus and here this is the way it should be done when you are testing for the action of the profundus the action uh, the the pip the mp joint and the pip joint they should be kept in extended then only the you will allow the fdp to to act 
this is uh, the bunnell's o sign the patient is able is asked to make an o on both sides and this he is able to do it on the normal side whereas on the affected side he is not able to make this o and this is because the paralysis of the of the anterior interosseous nerve which is a branch of the median nerve given in the forearm and uh, the this is this happens because there is paralysis of the anterior interosseous nerve leading to loss of the fpl and fdp so the fpl and fdp so the patient is not able to do make a, a o so this is called as a bunnell's o sign in the ulnar nerve you would test the flexor carpi uh, ulnaris and resistant uh, flexion at the wrist with little ulnar deviation they will make the uh, uh, fcu tendon stand out and uh, if if there is a paralyzed this thing you will not be able to do that another test for testing the fcu is you ask the patient to squeeze them and uh, you can see here there are some on one hand the wrinkles are more whereas in the other hand the wrinkles are little less and this happens because of the paralysis of the flexor carpi ulnaris the patient is not able to flex it completely to get a full grip of the of his hand and uh, therefore he is not able to squeeze it so therefore the the wrinkles which appear in this are actually proportionate to the power that he has because of the flexor carpi ulnaris then in the alana you test for the integrity of the interosseal by doing the car test and also you can test the uh, first dorsal uh, interosseal by doing the abduction of individual fingers there are a few more tests which are again uh, done to test for the interosseal muscles whether they are paralyzed or not you ask the patient to to cross the finger so he is trying to bring it on this side and take it on the other side as well and this actually he will not be able to do like he is not able to do it here because of the uh, paralysis of the interosseal you know that the palmar interosseal and the dorsal interosseal they they do the adduction and abduction respectively so you may not remember the names of this uh, this thing it is not essential for you to remember the names you just must know the the basic principle of the test that the patient you ask the patient to uh, to move the middle finger on either side and uh, this he will not be able to do uh, on an affected side because there is paralysis of the adductor uh, interosseal the cone test you ask the patient to make a cone of the fingers then this he will not be able to do on the affected side due to paralysis of the adductor pollicis muscle so he is not able to bring those uh, together the testing of the abductor digiti minimi and you can ask uh, by applying force uh, to the uh, to the action of the abductor digiti minimi this he will be able to do if there is intact but otherwise in a paralyzed hand the, the uh, this thing loses the control on the little finger because of the paralysis of the abductor digiti minimi so what happens is that because of the unopposed pull of the extensor tendon the little finger goes into a little abduction and hyper extension so you will not have a control over the little finger this is again because of the paralysis of the abductor digiti uh, minimi muscle then the paralysis of the flexor pollicis brevis actually will not be able to make a good uh, keep uh, pinch and as a result of which the thumb will go into uh, hyper extension and the the this grip will be weak so this is again to the test for the integrity of the ulnar nerve uh, the paralysis of the interosseal and hypothenar muscles they will actually there will be loss of lateral movement of the little finger he will not be able to actively bring the little finger onto the outer side so these are the various tests basically they are meant to test the intrinsics uh, of the uh, muscles of the of the hand then this is a very common test you all know this you ask the patient to hold a book and you try to snatch it away from him and uh, this is how he will hold it and on the normal side but on the affected side he will try to hold it uh, by flexing the ip joint of the thumb and this is because there is paralysis of the adductor pollicis here and therefore he is he is uh, uh, bringing the action of flexor pollicis longus he is employing the flexor pollicis longus to uh, hold the book and this is called as book test and this sign is called as froment sign so there are two different things don't confuse the test is called as a book test and the sign is called as 
of from end sign the classical uh, spot diagnosis thing is about the claw hand in the cases of ulnar nerve injury and the loss of the intrinsic function function causes the clawing of the fourth and the and the fifth digits so this is a very classical example of clawing of the of the of the hand and generally what happens is that the the clawing can be corrected if the mp joint is stabilized the because it as it goes into hyperextension if you stabilize the hyperextension at the mp joint by adding neutral or slight flexion the the deformity gets gets corrected and this is basically the principle of the most of the surgical procedures done for correction of the claw hand so what you do is in surgery for the correction of the claw hand by various procedures you will try to stabilize the mp joint in in neutral or in slightly uh, flex position which will correct the uh, the claw of the hand and this actually there is uh, this can be tested and this maneuver or test is called as bubius maneuver so what you do is you try with your finger you try to stabilize it in the in the slight flexion and uh, the the extensors the extensor tendons they will extend it the digit completely and the deformity gets corrected this is an important maneuver because it tests the integrity of the extensor mechanism it helps in choosing the correct surgical procedure for the correction of the claw hand if, if the test is positive that means if it gets corrected you can definitely go ahead and do a surgical procedure with good results but if it is negative that means it doesn't get corrected uh, by doing that maneuver that means there is some insufficiency of the extensor mechanism and it would require some augmentation and either the problem may be either flexor tendon shortening or or maybe the joint contracture and this is how you can see if the principle is followed properly the clawing can be corrected by any surgical procedure so in the examination you would test the uh, movements at the joints with the hand with the help of a goniometer and you can also test the strength in the uh in the hand muscles and also in the pinch as well there is a pinch gauge available for that then the sensory you all know the the sensations uh, they are supplied in the hand by the various nerves and uh, in the pin prick sensation if it is absent it's it suggests that there is a dense sensory loss and if it is present then one must do the testing for the soft touch uh, test uh, for the sensations the touch can be moving the testing of the touch can be done it can be moving or constant and this is how you do it for the moving touch you use the spin wheel and for the constant touch you have this testing of the two point discrimination this distance you can increase and with the patient closed his eyes you try to ask him that whether he is feeling two pricks or he is feeling one single prick for this for the receptor system in the nerves there are two types of receptor systems the quickly adapting fibers and the slowly adapting nerve fibers the quick uh, adapting fibers they are responsible for the moving touch whereas the slowly adapting are responsible for the constant touch and this is how the difference is that the the two point discrimination is uh, less in the pulp of the finger so that means the distance here is only the patient can feel two distinct pin points at a distance of 5 to 8 mm whereas as you go more proximal the distance is more so the two this two point discrimination depends upon the quickly adapting uh, nerve fibers and this returns early as compared to the slowly adapting fibers then dr dhal talked about the tunnel sign if the rate of growth is 1 mm per day just a little more detail about the tunnel sign as you as the time progresses and you are seeing the progression of the nerve recovery then and uh, you test it so the tunnel sign if it is less at the site type of injury and increasing distally that means it there is a good chance of useful recovery that means the nerve is regenerating and progressing distally if there is a strong tunnel sign and also an increasing tunnel sign dis distally paresthesia that distally that means there is some poor chance of recovery because there is some neurons are still there which are can getting converted into a neuroma and on this on the third scenario can be that there is a strong tunnel at the injury site but none distally that means there is no chance of recovery and one must go ahead and and uh, uh, explore or intervene the investigations have already been talked about by this thing i will only show you this uh, newer investigation that is the uh, neuroma this is the uh, mr actually neuroma this is mri and it's also called as neurogram uh, neuro mri also so what you do is and this you can see here this is the proximal cut it is showing the nerve here then this is the distal cut it is showing the nerve here but there is no uh, nerve seen here in the middle of the 
uh, lame or poor arm. So that suggests that there is definitely loss of continuity of the nerve and this helps you to take a decision. So when to operate, initially there is volerian degeneration and then the electivity, electrical activity starts only between two to four weeks and therefore the electrodiagnostic studies should only be done after three weeks. It is never reply that you know soon after the uh, injury you will do an EMG or an NCV, it will be pointless. Then this has already been talked about, the various types of uh, nerve injuries, the neuropraxia, these are the examples, uh, the Saturday night palsy or the crutch palsy, Exonotmosis would be well associated with fracture and neurotmosis is a stab injury or a gunshot injury. So the neuropraxia is generally uh, muscle atrophy is rare and it will conservative treatment is uh, all that will uh, suffice and usually full recovery occurs in about one to four months. However, if there is any doubt or delay, one can go ahead and, and explore and do a neurotmosis. This also has been talked about generally the neurotmosis or the exonotmosis they would require at least particularly the neurotmosis will definitely require surgery. Um, one has to observe for the exonotmosis. The indications would be now known to be divided but not repaired obviously will require uh, surgery and fractures with open wound will require treatment for both the fractures as well as the nerve. This has also been talked about by Dr. Uh, Dhal when is the timing for the nerve repair. And uh, in old injuries, you do repeated examinations. You look for this uh, sign, uh, tenial sign, whether it is, which scenario it is, whether it is progressing or not, and the EMG will also. And then if there is a painful neuroma, then obviously you have to go ahead and operate. So what surgery will you, will you advise? It can be in the form of either neurolysis, neurorephy or nerve repair, and nerve gafting. And here is an example of a neurolysis. This is the, uh, this is the hand, that's the, thumb side, you can see here the uh, vesting of the thinner muscles and the nerve was the median nerve explored. You can see here, this is the proximal end. The nerve is uh, more or less uh, normal, is rather normal here. It was the must have been the cut injury, the sign of earlier cut injury. And you can see here, there is so much of fibrosis surrounding the, surrounding the nerve. So um, all you need to, and perhaps it there appears as if it is the, the nerve is in continuity. So once after exploration, if it is intact, you only need to do neurolysis and the patient would have um, recovery uh, after some time. In the nerve repair, you, the best is to do an end-to-end -end repair whenever possible, but never under tension. If you see a scenario like this, an old injury, that's the nerve and you have a neuroma there, then the, it is essential that you excise the neuroma till you get the neural tissues and then do a nerve repair or do a uh, nerve graft as the case may be. What are the types of nerve repair? It can be epineural. Dr. Dhal has shown some beautiful examples about that. So you just repair the epineurium. Then it can be the fascicular repair, which can be in the groups. Uh, the fascicles can be repaired in groups or it can be repaired in, in uh, individually, fascicular repair or the funicular repair as it is called as. And uh, the suture uh, that we use is a very fine 9O or 10O nylon. And of course it requires magnification. You can't do without it. Here is an example of a digital nerve that is being cut here along with the tendon. These are the two tendons, the uh, superficialis and the dip, uh, FDP rather, to the little finger. And that's the nerve which has been sutured just with an epineural one stitch on this side and one stitch on that side that is good enough. And as, as said by Dr. Hal earlier, it is a sensory nerve, so it will have a good prognosis. Uh, the nerve repair can also be facilitated by mobilizing the nerve by doing transposition as in case of ulnar nerve, it is, when it is injured at the, behind the elbow, you can bring it anteriorly, you can get more length, flexing the joints, bone doing bone shortening. And if the gap is more than 2.5 centimeters, never repair it, go ahead and do a graft. So here is an example of a pinural nerve repair. This is the hand, that's the median nerve going into the hand. And this is all fibrosis and uh, this has been cleared. These are the uh, fascicles of the nerve going, branches of the median nerve going into the, into the palm. And this has been repaired by, by an epineural repair. So this is another example of a neuroma excision and an epineural nerve repair. And uh, this is also fascicular nerve repair. That means the neuroma is excised and the fascicles are separated. So there are three fascicles separated here, one, two, and three. And then you will use a nerve graft to bridge these, uh, these uh, cut the nerve cut ends. 
So what are the types of graft, nerve grafting that you can do? Trunk graft, cable graft, pedicle graft, intrafascicular nerve graft. I showed you an example picture of that. And individual fascicular nerve graft. And there are people also use a vascularized or non-vascularized nerve graft as well. The, where do you take the nerve from? The sural nerve is the commonest uh, site where you harvest the nerve for grafting. You get a very long uh, segment of nerve. Otherwise, these are the other uh, sites from where you can harvest the nerve. People also use allograft uh, for grafting it. And then the nerve conduits are also used selectively in certain cases. Here is an example. This is the ulnar nerve uh, at the elbow. And that is the cut hand here. And this is the cut hand here with the neuroma here. So this has been uh, cleared up. And this is the sural nerve graft taken you, without separating the fascicles. They just been sutured like this. So this is actually a cable graft. So you like a cable, you are just attaching them. Whereas this is a fascicular graft. You know, the fascicles are separated. And these are the fascicles separated here. And this is the graft. You can differentiate the junction of the graft with the, with the parent now. And the same here as well. Just to wind up about the compression neuropathy, about the median nerve uh, in the forearm. This is the uh, hand side, this is the elbow side, and uh, this is the median nerve that you can see here. And this is the um, uh, flexor uh, superficialis uh, fascia arch, facial arch, which is actually causing pressure on this, producing the pronator syndrome. And uh, as you release this here, it, it, you know, you can see there, this is now decompressed. And you can see the normal diameter of the nerve distally, whereas proximally under the compression here, this is thinned out so much. So there was definitely very considerable compression of the nerve in that area. Another example of an ulnar nerve uh, compression neuropathy, this patient had a big lipoma in the, sitting in the Guyans canal. And these are the ulnar nerve, they are the branching out. And this nerve was, ulnar nerve was getting stretched over it. So the lipoma was uh, dissected out and obviously the compression can be now be relieved. So to conclude, the nerve injuries are co common, often missed. So the clinical diagnosis and electrodiagnostic studies uh, should be done at the correct time. The surgery also should be at right time and use, choose the correct method for treatment. Nerves should be handled with uh, care in terms of, uh, because you should not uh, give uh, sort of much uh, surgical trauma while handling them. Otherwise, there will be more fibrosis and neuroma formation will occur because of your uh, poor handling of the nerves. So to conclude, the prompt diagnosis, proper treatment can uh, help you get Hello. Yes, sir. Continue, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. You are audible, sir. Yeah. Uh, is it? This is my. Did you see this slide? This is the concluding one. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. It's visible. Was I, was I audible? Yeah, yeah. You are audible, sir. Okay. Right. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kotwal. Uh, at present, there are <clears throat> no questions from the audience. So we can, uh, Dr. Vineet, we can move forward. Yes, I think. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I would like to invite Dr. Pankaj Jindal for his talk on. Uh, ah, right. hand. Dr. Vineet Arora, you had some question. Okay, you can Arora. continue. Uh, no, you can continue. Huh? Doctor, okay, okay, okay. Doctor, we can can I ask question? Yes, Dalla. sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Doctor, uh, 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 if you have to choose between epineural repair and the fascicular or the perineural repair. Mm -hmm. uh, are there different the results or how do you decide which, which, which kind of repair should be done in which situation? Yeah. Actually, the best is uh, individual fascicular repair. That's the best one because then you are actually uh, doing the correct co-optation. That means, uh, you know, the, because like Dr. Dal also said in, the, in a mixed nerve, there can be uh, uh, interconnect cross-connection between the sensory component and the and the uh, motor component. So if otherwise you are uh, trying to do the correct cooptation, uh, the nerve, and then separate out the physicals and do a physical to physical repair that is, that is supposed to give the best results. And for that, you of course, the thing is, it is a little more technically demanding because it definitely requires uh, magnifications. You are separating out and generally depending upon the 
the level of the nerve it can have either major three fascicles or major six fascicles so that means you will have to repair this thing but uh, in fresh injuries and if there is not much of uh, uh, cooperation difficulty you can even do a uh, epineural repair as well and particularly in uh, if there is a major cut for example if you are doing replantation or multiple nerve injuries tendon injuries and if there is a time problem then obviously you can do an epineural repair as well but like answering your question the best is fascicular and that's why people have also try to do a vascularized fascicular uh, nerve repair or uh, grafting for that matter so that you know it supposed to give uh, like for any vascularized bone grafting or whatever it's supposed to give better results thank you uh, sir dr kotwal dr yeah. kotwal can i have a question Sure. Sir, for a fresh, clear-cut injury of the two ends of the nerve, what is the best way to repair? Yeah, like I told you, if it is a fresh, clean-cut wound, you can even do an epineural repair also. The cooptation should be proper. That means you know the nerve should not be twisted and all those things. Then you can even do an epineural repair as well, or you can separate out the major fascicles. You know, even a, a nerve would have a major two or three fascicles at that level. If you can separate out that and do, even do that group, that's called as group fascicular repair. That also is uh, is generally okay. Yes, sir. Doctor Vineet, please uh, call yeah. the next speaker. Yeah. Uh, till time, Doctor Jindal is uh, sharing his screen. Uh, yeah, Doctor Kothal has to take. Yeah. Doctor Kothal, please un uh, unshare your screen. Okay. Okay. And I think Ravi will have to give uh, permission to Dr. Jindal to share his screen. Dr. Ravi? Yeah. In the meantime, I think Dr. Hitesh has a... Yeah, sir. Yeah, I have a question for Dr. Kothwal, sir. Can I ask? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sir, in a case with neuroma in continuity, how do you decide for operatively to do neurolysis or uh, excise the neuroma and do a, a formal repair? Yeah, it's a good question and uh, at times a difficult decision. The, what you need to do is under a little magnification, you dissect out the uh, neuroma because in continuity means there will be some fascicles which are intact, running normal, and there will be uh, some fascicles which will be injured and they, they will uh, lead into a neuroma formation. So what you need to do is you dissect out the fascicles, uh, isolate the uh, neuroma, excise that neuroma and try to repair that uh, fascicular thing. So therefore that you require, uh, as I said, magnification. The only risk about that is that in the process of dissecting out the fascicles and trying to isolate out the neuroma, you should not be damaging the uh, intact uh, nerve fibers or the, or the fascicles. But the, this actually would be, the, the, the question was how you decide. So this, there would definitely, there would be some partial uh, signs of nerve, nerve injury or something, or maybe as seen by the EMG, some muscles are working, some are not working, something of that kind. So that will also help you uh, take a decision about exploration. So we can used I, to inject I, saline I, I, operatively that time. Is it helpful? Sorry? We used to inject saline uh, proximally and see that saline propagated downwards or not. Uh, these are actually methods described all right, but I don't know this is uh, really that uh, diagnostic, um, okay. in my opinion. Can I, can I add a comment here? Yeah. Sure. Uh, these days we are using intraoperative electrical stimulation yeah. uh, to be able to decide whether the neuroma in continuity is conducting or not. So you will have to warn the anesthetist well in advance that in this particular patient, we will be using intraoperative stimulation and uh, therefore they will not be able to give any muscle relaxant. And uh, with that sort of a, maybe a, a brachial block or something, you can do an intraoperative stimulation, stimulating the nerve proximal to the neuromine continuity. And if you find that there are certain muscles distally which are contracting, then you can leave the neuroma, just do a neurolysis. Uh, you can do both internal as well as ex external neurolysis and leave it. And if it is a non-conducting type of neuroma, there is no muscle contraction distal to it, you can resect the neuroma and do an end-to-end -end repair. 
Uh, Dr. Vineet, uh, we will take questions later on because we are falling short of time. Dr. Vineet, can we continue? Okay. Dr. Pankaj Jindal, can you hear yeah, me? I'm ready. So can you see my slide? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks, the Delhi Orthopedic Association, Professor Marie Zavan, Dr. Sharad Grawal, Professor Dhal, for giving me this opportunity. Let's start on a talk on a paralytic hand. Okay. Uh, uh, we'll be talking about the general principles of treatment of a paralytic hand. We'll be touching on intrinsic minus hand, uh, the mechanism which leads to clawing, because that itself can be a uh, short case, uh, you can, uh, you might be asked to write, and on the from end sign. Uh, to restore a paralytic hand and to reanimate it, you might do a nerve surgery, that is either repair the nerve or you would do a nerve transfer. But this talk is about tendon related surgery. So how you can use tendon transfer to restore a uh, paralytic hand back to function. So what is so specific about the paralytic hand? The specific thing is, like in a median nerve injury, there may be loss of opposition. Like in the case of a ulnar nerve injury, you can have a loss of pinch, or in a wrist, or in a radial nerve injury, you can have a wrist drop, or it can go on like a brachial plexus injury. You can have an inability to flex or extend the elbow, or abduct or extend rotate the shoulder. So how do you approach a patient with a paralytic hand? You go in for a history and examination. So in the history you ask whether it's an acute problem or a chronic problem. And if there's a trauma, whether that's a recent trauma or a past trauma. Similarly, there's a history of viral or a fever uh, of recent origin of a past. So like you have a patient with an acute injury in this lockdown period, somebody stabbed this guy and he had a C5, C6 lesion here. So there's an acute injury here. Whereas this uh, boy, which we are going to talk in a little while again, is a chronic injury here. Because actually, as you can see, the skin is scarred and the joints are all stiff. Further in the physical examination on inspection itself, you can see the mark of injury along the surface anatomy of the nerves. You'll see wasting of the muscles. You can see deformities, which I am again going to repeat. You have a specific test, which like Professor Kotwal has mentioned earlier, or trinail sign here. So like, you have a patient with an injury on the, on the outer, on the radial, on the lateral aspect of the arm. So you can make on inspection, you have a suspicion in the back of your mind. Probably, probably you have a patient who has a radial nerve injury here. And again, this is along the surface anatomy of the radial nerve. And he is having this kind of a wrist drop here. So see the mark of injury along the surface anatomy and what lies under these scars. Similarly, you have an injury on the back posterior aspect here and on the, the injury was here, but small injury on the posterior aspect of the medial malleolus here. There was nothing here. The more important thing was the small tiny cut on the posterior aspect on the ulnar nerve, which was the cause of the distal deficit here. Similarly, like you have this uh, injuries here, you have this wasting here. These wasting suggest there's a problem in the median nerve distribution here. Carpal tunnel syndrome patient here presented with wasting of this uh, hand here. Then you see the deformity here. This was a childhood injury and there was a non-union of the lateral condyle giving rise to this cubital valgus. And what you see here, inability to adduct the finger here. So this was yet another problem here. So see the deformity here. This was a deformity clawing of the fingers here. Further, you see the gesture of the patient. The patient is telling you the surface anatomy of a nerve here. Rarely will the patient say, I've got pain in the hand. Patient will say, I've got numbness of the small finger. I've got numbness of the thumb. I've got numbness of the index finger. This finger feels difficult. This finger feels different. See the patient's gesture. What is he pointing at? What is she pointing at? Whether the patient is pointing out on the ulnar side, whether the patient is pointing at the radial side, or the patient is pointing at the far radial side here. The patient is telling you the surface anatomy of the affected nerve here. Or the patient said, I wake up in the middle of the night. I wake up as the hand is gone dead. The patient is telling you, I have got median nerve problem, carpal tunnel syndrome. Here. There are various tests 
I'm not going to go into the details, Professor. Uh, Kotwal has mentioned to you about the Fallon test, the reverse Fallon test, or the active middle finger flexion test. You flex it against the resistance here, and the patient says, ouch, the patient has got pain here. This is pronator TD syndrome here, from and sign. Here the book test here, or the passive elbow flexion test. As you flex the elbow here, the patient said, I've got tingling in the small finger. So this is for suggesting of a learn nerve deficit. Again, the tinnel sign, you tap on the nerve and the patient gets shooting pain down the sensory part of the nerve here. You start from the brachial plexus, go in the supraclavicular, infraclavicular, along the medial side of the arm, into the medial side of the elbow, into the medial nerve, into the ulnar nerve here. So you, on tinnel sign, will again suggest which nerve is getting affected here. Distal of the forearm, you have three nerves here, the median nerve, ulnar nerve, and the radial nerve. But proximal to the forearm, you have you can go right up to the brachial plexus here. So multiple nerves can be affected proximal to the elbow joint also. You are supposed to know the power of each muscle and based on the medical research council grading here, zero to five, this is extremely important because uh, based on this, you are going to do your tendon surgery here. I'll come back to that in a little while here, but you must know how to grade them based on MRC. Professor Kotwal again uh, made my life easy here. You must identify because this can be a potential donor here. So test individual muscle. The word is individual muscles. Each muscle has to be tested individually. Index, middle, ring is small. And also Professor Kotwal has published a paper on identification of the palm is longest here. So identify the palm is longest also here. So confirm which muscles are paralyzed, which muscles are, do which muscles are active, and are spareable here. I'll come back to that. So having identified the motor uh, muscles uh, which are affected or not affected, you come to the sensation here. The sensation is varying according to the cause of the imbalance here. Like in polio, the sensation is normal. In Hansen and leprosy, the sensation is absent. Whereas in peripheral nerve lesion, like you have a cut in the forearm, depending on the level, it may be variably affected here. Similarly, in syringomalia, the sensation is partly affected here. Now, let's talk further. The physiological basis of tendon surgery in a paralytic hand here. Now, the muscles are active and they are controlled at the brain level, at the conscious level or a subconscious level. At a conscious level or at a subconscious level. Like this child. The child is learning to balance very consciously. He might trip a little uh, quite a few times here, bruise himself, but most of his activities to start with, to start with a conscious level. But as he goes further and further, these become some subconscious level and balancing is subconscious, pedaling is subconscious from left to right, from left to right, from left to right, he keeps doing. And this is a repeated activity. It is this repeated activity that what happens with this uh, activity uh, happening repeatedly, it becomes a pattern. And what is this pattern? This pattern is what is called as a synergy. This is synergistic or working together. So certain movements become synergistic. And what is this synergistic movement? The wrist extension and finger flexion, and this is happening at a subconscious level. So let's dilate with these two things again. So what are these synergistic actions? Wrist extension is happening together with finger flexion. These are synergistic actions here. Similarly, wrist flexion and finger extension are synergistic action and they're happening subconsciously, subconscious level here, and they do not require significant effort in happening together here. Whereas there are other actions which can also happen which are non-synergistic action, like extension of the finger and extension of the uh, wrist are non-synergistic action. Similarly, Flexion of the finger and flexion of the wrist are non-synergistic action. And what is the applied importance of this synergy? In treating paralytic hand by tendon transfer, the first choice should be a tendon whose muscles are normally synergistic with the paralyzed muscles. And therefore, choose synergistic muscle as the first choice here. The next thing that you need to know about the agonist and the antagonist here when it comes to the joint movement here. This is the normal lie of the fingers here, which means if the patient is flexing the fingers, the corresponding extensors are relaxing. So there are one agonistic which are working and then a 
corresponding agonistic are relaxing. So these two things are working together. But if the agonist is paralyzed, the antagonist is unopposed. If it is unopposed and is remaining unopposed, it develops what is called as now a stiffness here. So when agonist is paralyzed, antagonist is unopposed, in due course this becomes permanent and becomes stiff unless you are doing passive range of motion here. So remember, passive range of motion is important so that you prevent a stiffness from setting in here. A classical example is a claw hand here. A classical example means the lumbrical entrosh are lying anterior to the MP joint and dorsal to the PIP joint here. So if they get paralyzed, this entrosh or lumbricals are paralyzed, they go into reverse posture, that is hyperextension of the MP joint and flexion at the proximal interphalangeal joint. So you get a hyperextension at the MP joint and flexion at the proximal interphalangeal joint. And how it can happen? There are various causes. And what can be the cause? You need to know a paralytic condition like a Guillain-Barré syndrome, landry guillain syndrome, uh, spelled as Guillain-Barré syndrome here. Or it can be because of a, a common condition in some parts of the country, leprosy or trauma. So these can be the various causes which can lead to loss of intrinsic function of the hand here. So you need to, to restore function, you need to know certain principles and certain prerequisites for tendon transfer. So what are the pre principles here? Examine. Examination will consist of two parts, what is lost and what is remaining. So what can be achieved from what is remaining? So this is what is going to donate to what is lost here. So how you can compensate the A that is lost from B? And that is all about tendon transfer that you need to know to start with here. Having examined, then you need to know what is remaining and what are the donor muscles. Are they expendable? Can they be spared? Are they of sufficient power? Sufficient power, we talked of uh, the strength, the grading, grade 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. If they are already 3, you can't use them for motoring the paralyzed muscles. So you should have a good power here and appropriate amplitude. They should be working. They can't be having paralysis here. They should be synergistic. We talk about this and they should have an appropriate alignment vector. We'll talk about this and perform one per function. So you enumerate what is lost, you enumerate what is available, and then what are the usual things which are available? Usual available muscles are the FDS of the ring, FDS of the middle, brachioradialis, palmaris longus, extensors of the wrist, extensor alaris, often, most often FCR, and FCU, and biceps. These are the muscles which are usually available here. So find out what is lost, what is available, and you enumerate them on either side here. And based on which is easily available, which has a good trajectory and has a good vector, which has a good excursion, you match. And suppose this is a case of a radial nerve palsy. You have a loss of wrist extension, finger extension, a loss of thumb extension. You see what is available and you match as a table one to table two and you have a good functional hand here. The next thing is the tendon transfer. Tendon transfer basically is an interplay of motor and the root, which basically means if you are at this cross section here, at your intersection here, you go north, you reach New Delhi, you go west, you go to Mumbai, and similarly you would reach other way, depending on the route that you have taken. So if you have a muscle, which is attached to the radial side of the MP joint, it becomes an abductor. If the same muscle is transferred to the ulnar side, it rotates the thumb also on the CMC joint, it becomes an opposition. Similarly, the same muscle coming in between the metacarpal, instead of becoming an abductor, it becomes an adductor because it is now pulling the thumb towards the rest of the muscles. So the root is the second important thing that will decide the function you are targeting to. Then the evaluation of the muscle. We talked about the expandability of the muscle, then the, about the strength of the muscles here. The strength is important because usually a muscle will lose a grade one when it is transferred. So it is grade five, it will become grade four. It is grade four, it becomes grade three, grade three, which basically means you cannot choose a muscle which is already grade three because grade two will be a useless function. So you have to have a muscle which is important, which is uh, strong. Next thing we talked was about the amplitude of the excursion. There are various muscles which have a variable amplitude, like the wrist extensor have an amplitude of about 33 millimeter, whereas the profundus has an amplitude of 70. Which means if you are using 
wrist extensor to power the finger flexor you will get only about 50% of the excursion but you have no other choice but you have a choice between wrist extensor to finger flexor and therefore you should warn the patient that you will be getting a 50% function based purely on the tendon transfer rest will come somewhere else we'll talk about that the next thing about the synergism we talked about it rehabilitation of a muscle whose tendon has been transferred is less difficult when you transfer this synergistic therefore always choose a preferably a synergistic muscle here then we talked of the vector the blue car will have a difficulty in maneuvering this curve as compared to, to the red car here similarly this van when it makes a straighter curve it is easier for it to maneuver this curve and therefore when you choose a muscle see to it that it has a vector which is relatively more straight otherwise it changes uh, inadequately inefficiency sets in and therefore choose a muscle which has a straighter excursion which again means dissect out the muscle more proximally so that it uh, reaches the target more efficiently here so having identified the motor having identified the route you have to go into the local requirement which means the prerequisites of a local uh, tendon transfer here you have to have a soft unscarred milieu i'll deal with it again the joint should be soft and supple the joint should be having no deformity the sensitivity should be good which basically means you restore function in hand which is insensate he will burn his hand he will damage his hand further and therefore restore sensibility preferably primarily here and most important thing is stabilization of the neural recovery when the patient is still recovering you do, do the tendon transfer it's not worth it because the patient is likely to recover spontaneously or patient is deteriorating and you do a tendon transfer you do a muscle which is already affected uh, which is not affected you do a tendon transfer and sooner or later that muscle is also going to get affected then it is not worth it therefore the neural recovery or deterioration should stabilize before you take up this patient for surgery now let's talk about first two three things here can you do anything to this car you can't set in the engine right because the outside is not good unless the outside is proper which basically means the outside that means the skin is uh, damaged here you can't do any median nerve surgery here you can't do any flexor tendon surgery because the skin is scarred and it can't have any excursion here unless you do a flap on this patient so the same patient the flap has been done before any internal surgery can be done here coming to the soft and supple again unless the joints are good you can't do any anything to this patient here so again this patient had a scarred joints here and we mobilize these joints with various dynamic splints and before any deeper surgery can be carried out third thing about the correction of the joints here this patient had bony fusion on the dorsal aspect here though the rest of the joint was intact we freed up the joint on the dorsal aspect interposed so that it does not occur before any surgery can be carried out here therefore again very important here the correction of the joint deformity should be set in order before any surgery can be carried out here certain nerve transfers may also be useful to restore fun function of the hand alone or in concomitantly and this has to be considered as well i am not going to talk about this right now i am not talking about thumb opposition and i am not talking about opposition because there are some other so there are some other important thing that we need to consider low median nerve median and ulnar nerve palsy are common leading to cloying and this is because of paralysis of the lumbrical intrasia what happens here lumbrical the intrasia lying anterior to the axis of the mp joint and dorsal to the axis of the pip joint here so when this muscle is paralyzed it leads to hyperextension of the mp joint and flexion of the pip joint i'll delve with it further but important to know we talk about cloying not because that is the only paralytic condition but because numerous muscles and numerous joints come into play bringing the biomechanics into play so there are other conditions also but this is relatively more complicated and therefore we talk about this in greater detail here so what happens when you have a intrinsic paralysis it have leads to two things one thing is a hyper extension of the metacarpophalangeal joint in a mobile hand if the hand is stiff 
well, it may not really happen. So the cause is hyperextension of the MP joint leading to clawing. And the second thing, there's a lack of power of the flexion of the MP joint, which can be to the extent of more than 50% here. That means 50% of the hand power is lost just because of this deformity here. And therefore, the solution lies in preventing metacarpophalangeal MP joint hyperextension. And the whole treatment lies, revolves around prevention of MP joint hyperextension here. So, this is another important thing for post gadgets pathophysiology of clawing here. Just understand this photograph, this is extremely important. There is no way it can be simplified here. Extensor digitorum communis, the long extensor is working. Now, let me first understand, let me explain you what is this. This is the metacarpal, this is the proximal phalanx, this is the middle phalanx, and this is the distal phalanx here. These two green things are the lumbrical and the entrosia here. And this is the extensor of the, long extensor of the MP joint here. When the extensor digitorum communis is working on the MP joint, it causes extension of the metacarpophalangeal joint. As it tightens further, as it contracts further, it tries to extend the PIP joint and the DIP joint also. But there are strong sublimisor profundus working on the PIP and DIP joint. They prevent further extension of the uh, PIP and DIP joint under the effect of EDC here. That basically means if you cut the FDS and FDP, if you cut the FDS and FDP, you will be able to extend the PIP and DIP joint. But in real life, you can't cut the flexor tendons. You can do something else. And what is that something else? You flex the wrist. If you flex the wrist, now under the added TNODC section of the EDC, you will be able to do extension of the PIP joint and the DIP joint. But this leads to inefficiency because the strength of the wrist, the strength of the finger flexor is extended position. And therefore, somehow, you have to extend the finger. And the simplest thing, as Professor Kotwal mentioned, is prevent ex hyperextension of the PI, uh, hyperextension of the MP joint here. What you do, you make this lax here. So added tightening of the EDC, added excursion of the EDC will now will, will be transmitted to the PIP joint and the DIP joint. And now you can extend the PIP joint and the, the DIP joint. So you prevent the hyperextension of the MP joint to get extension of the PIP joint and the DIP joint. And this is called as the Bouvier's test or the Bouvier's maneuver, which basically means here, you prevent hyperextension of the MP joint and ask the patient to actively extend the PIP joint if the patient can do it. That means the extensor tendons are useful and can be uh, used for uh, treatment. Which further means if the patient is not able to extend the PIP joint, that means the central slip has become stretched out and you cannot use this for surgery here. And therefore, this has a clinical, implication, uh, clinical implications. If on doing a bouvier's maneuver, if the intrafalangeal joint do not extend, that means the central slip is stretched out here. This has, again, the clinical impl implications. Like when you're doing a lasso procedure, again, I'll come back to that here. If you flex the MP joint here, if the central slip is stretched out, this surgery is not going to work. So what is the effect of intrinsic muscle weakness? Either it, one thing it causes hyperextension and second thing is lack of power. We talked about hyperextension and how to prevent it. And second thing is the loss of power. What happens in a normal situation? MP joint flexes first followed by PIP joint flexion. And the third thing to flex is the DIP joint. But here it is reversal. It is first that IP joint which flex and the MP joint happen to flex in the end, which means the finger flexes and closes first. And therefore this leads to loss of power of the MP joint, which is more than 50% here. And this reversal has to be corrected also. So what is the aim of correction of the claw? The aim is very simple, block. MP joint hyperextension, and there are various procedures which are available here, which are active and passive. Active is using a tendon transfer, passive is using, uh, not using a tendon, which is either a capsule correction, tendon correction, bone correction, or orthodesis here. Various muscles are available. Which one to use is based on the experience and the opinion of the surgeon here. 
but the bottom line is target mp joint flexion and pip joint extension and the root is always always volar to mp joint because that's the root followed by lumbricals and entrosia and it is dorsal to pip joint here there are various tendon transfers available various motors are available we talked about it earlier it's very important for graduates to know your all these names bunnels modified bunnels fowlers riordans brands riordans various tendon transfers are available it's not possible to go into the details because you have to go through them again and again again and again to understand the difference but bottom line as i said earlier is the tendons are going volar to mp joint and dorsal to ip joint so there are various transfer you are supposed to know here ef40 is very popular among very senior surgeons here and you may be asked what are these so you are supposed to does it make a difference it makes no difference ultimately you want to correct hyper extension of the metacarpophalangeal joint then we talked about this lasso procedure here this you take the sublimis there is a pulley which is called as an a1 pulley which is spanning the metacarpophalangeal joint on the volar aspect you take out the sublimis tendon and you loop it loop it around the mp joint so that pulley is used around which it is looped so that the moment you tighten this uh, sublimis tendon it will flex the mp joint which means you are preventing the hyper extension of the metacarpophalangeal joint and this is called as a zancoli's lasso procedure here when the tendons are not available you do a passive procedure which means you cut a part of the capsule of the mp joint here and you tighten this this capsule this is similar you have t no disease here coming to something more that will be the, the clawing and the from end sign if you have a patient with allan of palsy or allan motor uh, allan median palsy you will have symptoms on the radial side you will have symptoms on the allan side here the symptoms on the radial side are because of paralysis of the adductor pollicis sexual pollicis brevis i'll come back to that to make it simplify and and third and fourth entrosia the lumbricals of the index finger and middle finger are working because they are innervated by the median nerve and therefore index finger and median middle finger may not show clawing unless the median nerve is also affected and we talked about the clawing on the other side so we'll not talk about it so let's see what's happening on the radial side here and this is pinching action the pulp of the thumb comes in contact with the radial side of the index finger leading to a pinch here now see what's happening here this is important because uh, you have to understand next three slides because we'll come to why from end sign uh, comes extensor pollicis longus is acting on the ip joint of the thumb extensor pollicis brevis is working on the mp joint and abductor pollicis longus is working at the base at the cmc joint here whereas on the radial side of the mp joint abductor pollicis brevis is coming a flexor pollicis brevis is coming and on the allan side adductor adductor pollicis is coming and the big boss the big very active uh, thick uh, tendon is a flexor pollicis longus which is coming on the ip joint here the moment you have a patient with allan nerve palsy or allan median nerve palsy the three muscles become inactive here apb is not working flexor pollicis brevis is not protracted adductor pollicis is not working so you have muscles on the back your muscles in the front now what happens in the absence of these three things the moment patient tries to flex the fpl takes the bigger role here and now it tries to oppose and therefore you leads to you see what is called as now a from end sign here so you see a from end sign of the book uh, test becomes positive here and because there is hyper extension at the metacarpophalangeal joint that is what is called as the jeans test here so this is what leads to the uh, from end sign becoming positive in a patient with uh, allan median palsy here so we talked of radial side symptoms we talked of allan side symptoms of course you can have lesions more proximal we'll, we'll, we'll just touch these things here because of brachial plexus injuries here and the patient will have inability to abduct so you do either fusion or you do some kind of a tendon transfer like in a obpp palsy here so coming to in summary you find out what is loss what is available and choose a synergistic muscle choose an appropriate uh, route and you do a tendon transfer under a good quality skin with a soft joint 
provided the patient had good sensation and the patient has stabilized neurologically. The bottom line is you have to prevent the MP joint extension, hyperextension by doing an active tendon transfer. If no tendon is available, you have a passive procedure here. I am open to question if there is any. Thank you, sir, Thank for you. this wonderful talk. And uh, the illustrations are very good, actually. Uh, Dr. Vinay, uh, Dr. Dabas? Yes, sir. Uh, you can request the next speaker to get ready. And there are and, few uh, questions for the audience, from the audience. For Dr. Dr. Kothwal, can I ask them? I'm the next speaker, sir. I need to start my... Okay, uh, so there are two. You can start that. Uh, there are two questions from audience for Dr. Kothwal. Can I ask that? Yeah, sure. Uh, Dr. Kothwal, what are uh, all tendon transfers to be done for median lap palsy, thumb opposition and FDS? Um, for opposition, uh, opponents plus T, there are multiple tendons available. And uh, if there is only median nerve paralysis, then you can take uh, the flexor, uh, flexor deuterum sublimus from the ring finger and uh, uh, do the opponent's plasty. Sometimes there is uh, paralysis of both median as well as ulnar nerve and you don't have any tendon available on the molar side. Then on the dorsal side, you can the most commonly done tendon transfer is the uh, transferring the EIP, extensor indices proprius and bringing it there, uh, onto the molar side. So this also can uh, actually work very well. So of course there are many that really cannot be covered up here, but these are the ones which are commonly done, the branch transfer and the EIP transfer. Okay. And uh, sir, is the why there is loss of thumb abduction in median nerve palsy of abductor pollicis brevis? When abductor pollicis longus is still working, uh, which is supplied by radial nerve? I see the uh, flexor pollicis longus, the, you are talking about the median nerve paralysis. Sorry, Ed, can you repeat the question? Why there is loss of thumb abduction in median nerve palsy of abductor pollicis brevis when abductor pollicis longus is still working, which is supplied by radial nerve? Yeah, agreed. But the main powerful muscle is the abductor pollicis brevis, which actually causes the thumb abduction. And even in all uh, operations of uh, opponent's plasty, when you insert the uh, transfer tendon, you duplicate the action of abductor pollicis brevis. So you insert it into that. So that is the most com powerful muscle. The okay. abductor pollicis, yeah. I think Pankaj wants to intervene. Uh, if you can see my face, abductor pollicis longus is abduction in the plane of the hand. Plane of the hand, abductor pollicis longus, where opposition is at right angle. So. There's a big difference. It's a palmar abduction. This and this is this is radial abduction and this is a palmar abduction. So palmar abduction initiates the word is initiate initiate the act of opposition. So there are big difference. Ninety degrees. Am I right, Professor Kothwal? Yes, yes. It does. It can only can only helps. It cannot cause complete abduction. It the, initiate. Uh, that initiate. Yes, it can initiate. I, I was about coming to that. It can only initiate. It cannot actually cause that. Dr. Hitesh had a question. This is the last question, Dr. Hitesh. You want to ask? I will ask later. I will ask after this. Okay. Talk. Dr. Vineet, you can please continue. Yeah. Am I audible, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, uh, this talk for the next 15 minutes, I wanted to focus mostly on things that uh, a postgraduate is expected to know in his exam when he's dealing with a patient with radial nerve paralysis. Uh, this is just to complete the slide. I'm not going to dwell into the anatomy a lot. This is purely a theoretical topic and I would encourage the postgraduates to revise their anatomy. Uh, all I want to mention here is that the radial nerve in the spiral groove on the posterior aspect of the arm is the most common site where the radial nerve is injured. Like any other nerve, it can be injured at anywhere along its course. It can be compressed by various causes, but this is the most common site and then on the anterolateral aspect of the elbow and when it passes on to the forearm, that is the second, that is the other more common site where it gets injured. Uh, this Dr. Dhal has already covered and it makes my life easy that we need to know the muscles that are supplied by the nerve, but we also need to remember the order in which they are supplied. This helps us in uh, delineating the level of injury when it is not obvious. It may be a double level injury in certain patients 
it may not be an obvious cause and we are looking for a cause. So by doing a muscle charting, we are able to uh, have a gross idea where the nerve is injured. Plus, I would like to, uh, at this stage, uh, you know, bring about this classification of a very high rate nerve paralysis. These injuries are usually in the axilla, where, uh, which is proximal to the branches of the triceps, supplying the triceps, and the triceps is paralyzed. It's a rare uh, uh, scenario where radial nerve is paralyzed, but the uh, which is distal to the brachial plexus but proximal to the triceps branches. So practically, we don't see these patients very often. Uh, high radial nerve paralysis will be uh, typically have a normal elbow extension, but they will have wrist drop and they will have paralysis of the finger extensors and the thumb extensors. Low radial nerve paralysis, as Dr. Dhal has already mentioned, the brachioradialis is considered an important muscle to delineate between high and low. But as for the Campbell, uh, Campbell's orthopedics and my understanding, the low radial nerve paralysis will be where the wrist extension is still possible. That means one of at least one of the wrist extensors is still functional. So in this case, wrist extension would be there, but there will be no extension at the metacarpophalangeal joints and extension of the thumb. Typically, these patients will have a radial deviation while they are extending the wrist. Coming to the common causes before I go into the examination, uh, we all know the uh, one of the most common scenarios is a fracture shaft humerus where the radial nerve is paralyzed. Most of these cases in closed injuries have neuropraxia and Dr. Dell has already uh, discussed the management, so I'm not going to dwell into too much. The open uh, fracture is one particular situation where we expect a uh, a higher incidence of nerve uh, transactions and I would uh, I usually would recommend that as a part of the debridement of the open wound the nerve should be explored and if it is found cut either repaired or at least tagged so that it can be repaired at the earliest. This is a, another common cause where uh, uh, this is one of the cases where the humerus shaft was plated elsewhere the patient had a radial of uh, injury it was found lacerated. It was tagged by the surgeon there as they did not uh, have the full facility for nerve repair. And I explored this again and did the nerve repair. This is this uh, another scenario in the, on the anterolateral aspect just proximal to the elbow or in the posterior aspect of the arm where a sharp laceration leads to radial nerve injury. And we have already talked about uh, principles of nerve repair, so I won't dwell into it again. Other common causes, post-operative, while approaching the humerus from the posterior aspect, even from the anterolateral aspect, it is not that the nerve cannot be injured. One has to be careful, even when they are going from the anterior or anterolateral aspect, that it can be injured if you are not careful. Saturday night palsy and crutch paralysis, these are usually because of uh, compression. Saturday night palsy typically would happen in an inebriated uh, patient or a patient in deep sleep where the arm is, uh, is over the edge of a hard surface and they get up in the morning and there's a wrist drop. Luckily, these have very good prognosis and they recover on their own. Post-injection paralysis, again, luckily we are seeing less and less. They behave differently. They don't follow these uh, sedans classification. They don't typically follow the pattern of neuropraxy or exanotomesis. And missile injuries can happen uh, anywhere along the course of the radial nerve. And so topic in itself, I won't again dwell into the management or the prognosis of this injury. Coming straight forward to uh, what I feel is important for a postgraduate student while examining this is examination of a patient with radial nerve paralysis. While, typically while examining this patient, I would, uh, I would divide my examination into three parts. One would be the site of injury, the local examination at the site. If there is a fracture, whether it is healed or not healed, are there any wounds, are there any surgical scar, how is the soft tissue condition, is there any sign of infection, is there any sinuses, and so on and so forth. Uh, then I will proceed into the motor examination. Motor examination typically will have wasting of the forearm. This is a low motor type injury, which will have wasting of the forearm muscles in the posterior compartment of the forearm and a typical deformity of wrist drop, which Dr. Hull has already uh, shown. This is just a repetition of the same thing. Wrist drop, no active extension. By stabilizing, the, it is difficult to uh, examine the metacarpophalangeal joint extension in this position. It's already visible that MCP are in extension because of the wrist flexion. 
and the tenodesis effect of the extensors. So it is important to stabilize the wrist in extension while we are testing for MCP extension and testing for the EDC. At this stage, I'll uh, again mention the importance of examining the palmaris longus because it will be useful in tendon transfer, which we'll discuss later. The sensory component of the radial nerve, uh, typically it is described by various authors that it is not so important. It's a very small area. The autonomic zone is very small area on the dorsum of the first rest space. At times it may not be very well delineated and clinically uh, this is a non-contact area of the hand and for all practical purposes, the radial nerve is considered to be a motor nerve. The motor function is what we are mainly concerned with in radial nerves. Muscle testing, we'll start with triceps. Uh, uh, not to miss out that muscle testing or any other examination will also include examination of the other nerves to be sure that we are dealing with the isolated radial nerve paralysis. Please do not go with the idea that we straight away start hitting on the radial nerve and this is all we have to examine. The examination should be complete with examination of the other nerves, vascular examination, and uh, like in a, any other short case. The muscles typically which are important for examination in a radial nerve paralysis, triceps, brachioridalis. Dr. Dhal has shown a very beautiful slide of examining a brachioridalis. I'll again show the slide. ECRB, ECRL would be wrist extension and radial elevation. Here, some of the examiners may ask, about how to differentiate between ECRB and ECRL power. It's a very difficult, uh, it's, one cannot be absolutely sure, but one can flex the elbow and test for wrist extension and that would be ECRB. And with the wrist extended, ECRL would become effective. For all practical purpose, these are muscles which are closely uh, supplied by the radial nerve and in uh, practically in most of the cases, they will be paralyzed together. So uh, we may not, be asked whether we want to test them separately or not. EDC extension at the metacarpophalangeal joints, I've already shown the slide how to do that. ECU would be wrist extension and ulnar deviation. EPL is one of the easiest muscles uh, here because it is a pure action, a single joint extension at the IP joint, no other muscle is causing that extension. However, uh, I would warn the uh, student that in some patients, because of insertion of the adductor pollicis brevis and adductor pollicis on the extensor expansion of the thumb, the patient may give slight extension at the thumb, just like that, but they would not go through the full range of motion. One has to be careful that this is not action of the EPL. If that happens, that is because of insertion of the extent of the adductor pollicis brevis into the extensor expansion of the thumb. APL and EPB is thumbs up as Dr. Jindal has beautifully explained. In the palm of the thumb, we ask the patient to extend the thumb and see for the function of these muscles. Brachioridalis being important, Dr. Dhal has explained the importance. It tells us whether it is a high or low radial nerve paralysis. Also the most common site being in the arm, this would be the first muscle to recover. So if in a fracture shaft humerus patient, I want to see if the nerve is recovering or not. Every time the patient visits me, I would look at the brachioridalis. If it starts recovering, then I'm comfortable that there, the motor march has started. This being a, uh, mostly a motor nerve, the tunnel sign may not be very evident. So this becomes very important. The motor power of brachioidalis is difficult to ascertain. We can look at the contraction of the muscle while asking the patient to flex the elbow with the forearm in mid-prone position. Trick movements, I'll show a video, tenodesis effect, Dr. Dahl has already shown. I'll just show a video on my own hand, having seen these patients, how the movement happens. And extension of the IP joints can be misread as extension of the fingers, and one has to be careful while examining this patient. Extension of the IP joints will happen in a patient with radial nerve paralysis because of the intrinsic being intact. The student, from my point of view, needs to be aware of this concept of apparent weakness of ulnar nerve in radial nerve paralysis. With the MCP joint in flexion, not stabilized in extension, the intrinsic muscles are slack. And due to that, the abduction and adduction cannot happen. So while examining the ulnar nerve in these patients, I would stabilize the MCP joint in extension and then ask the patient to adduct and abduct. If we don't know this fact, we may also label this patient as having a ulnar nerve weakness. So uh, quickly going through the video, this is the tenodesis effect with the extensors being stretched using the finger flexion. The patient is able to raise the wrist, but not beyond the neutral. 
we'll hardly bring it to the neutral. So I'll ask the patient to raise the wrist with either the fingers extended or the fingers flexed, not allowing him to do that while raising the wrist and look for the contraction of the muscle. This is the other trick movement where the IP joint are extending. The things become more difficult when there is a plaster splint extending the MCP joint or a cock up splint, which is poorly applied. And as you can see, this is giving an impression of extension of the fingers. Uh, uh, like Dr. Uh, Jindal was explaining, we need to know what is the weakness or the disability in lateral paralysis. The most common complaint that the patient comes to us with, obviously deformity, but also weakness in grip and pinch. How that happens is because the wrist inflection gives slack to the flexor tendons of the fingers. And unless we stabilize the wrist in 15 to 20 degrees extension, the full grip power cannot be achieved. Similarly, in the pinch, the thumb needs to be stabilized and if it is not stabilized well, the pinch will be weak. Actually, we have also we have done this study, and there is at least 50 to 60 percent weakness in grip and pinch in these patients. It becomes difficult to release objects. And if we want to grasp a large size object, the fingers need to be extended fully. Nerve repair has been discussed. I won't go into details, but radial nerve is usually considered a good nerve for neurography because it is purely motor. And the distance that it needs to travel before supplying the muscles involved is relatively small. Timings also has been discussed. I won't dwell into it. Splintage, various splints are available. A simple wrist immobilizer, a beautiful costly splint like this, a dynamic cock up splint or something which is available at a lesser cost, uh, which is bulky and has social stigma, makes the hand use of hand difficult. So a patient who's going to the office just needs to stabilize the wrist may choose just a wrist immobilizer and nothing more than that. As a preference, dynamic splints should be preferred because they prevent uh, contractures. They allow the opposite movement and the opposite movement doesn't get restricted, which can happen in a static splint. So uh, going further from what Dr. Jindal has already explained, we look at what is the deficit, the wrist extension, finger extension and thumb extension and abduction. We look at what is available, what muscles are available, and we come to a formula as to what to do. Now, a typical answer for radial paralysis would be a triple transfer. Triple Jones transfer or a modified triple Jones transfer usually becomes difficult. There are at least nine or 10 modifications of, tri of triple Jones transfer. So for understanding, I would say that let's look at what is available and what needs to be restored. So pronator TDs, to ECRB, some authors attach it to both, but ECRB being the central tendon gives wrist extension. This is the most important wrist extensor actually. And attaching the pronator TDs to ECRB is, is almost consistent in any of the triple transfers which are described. Finger extension can be FCU, FCR, or FDS. Dr. Jindal has again uh, made my job easy. FCU and FCR are synergistic transfers. FDS is non-synergistic transfer, but the excursion of FDS is closer to EDC. So some authors do prefer FDS for extension, although being the non-synergistic, it is difficult to train the patient for that. Again, one of the consistent transfers, so variation is mostly in the finger extension. Another consistent transfer is thumb extension and abduction by palmaris longus, which is attached to re-rooted re -rooted EPL. By re-rooting the EPL, Along, from the dorsum to the radial aspect of the thumb, we are able to achieve some amount of radial abduction also. So most of the transfers that we'll read about will have these two components as consistent and this would be the variation. This is the original Jones transfer where both FCU and FCR were used for extension of the fingers. This is considered not such a good uh, uh, policy because we cannot take away both the strong wrist flexors. It causes disability for the patient. But this is what original Jones transfer was described. It, he has described it in two different papers. And if you can see, FCR insertion is variable in the two transfers which have been defined, uh, described by Jones. The most consistent transfers are this. I've already said, pronator TDs to wrist extension, palmaris longus for EPL, and FCR for finger extension or FC for finger extension. These are the most common triple transfers that we use for tendon transfer. We can discuss the plus and minus of FCR versus FCU. I think it will be beyond the scope of this lecture 
if I start going into the details of that. Uh, standard picture from Greens, I won't again dwell into it. Uh, some authors prefer straight away going for tenant transfer, which Dr. Thal has explained may not be the best policy, but in certain situations like large gaps, very high lesions where the recovery may take a long time, excessive scarring and old age, one may choose to do a tenant transfer straight away as the definite treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vineet. Uh, Dr. Vineet, uh, can we go to the next speaker and then we take questions at the end? Yes, sir. Sure. Because I'll, now uh, six, six twenty. So let yeah, us first finish the. Dr. Ajish, I would like to invite Dr. Ajish with his brachial plexus talk. I think for the exam purpose, brachial plexus uh, is an important short case. So let's go on to that. If we have time, we'll go for the lower limb. Otherwise, we'll uh, finish up with the brachial plexus. Uh, no, no. Let let us finish all the presentation. Uh, sure. I think Dr. Ajish, please be. Quite, uh, you know, crisp about the presentation. Yeah. Okay, Doctor. Ajish, are you ready? Doctor Ajish, can you hear us? We can't hear you, Ajish. Yeah, am I audible now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, thanks to the organizers at uh, the Delhi Orthopedic Association to uh, invite me for this talk. I'll start off with the brachial plexus palsy uh, assessment and strategy. So, uh, this talk is, I don't intend this to be a very high end talk. We'll try, try to keep it for what the students would need to get through an exam. So, it's, uh, focus basically on the examination and muscle charting, which I feel is the most difficult part of uh, the brachial plexus uh, palsy short case. So adult brachial plexus palsy, that's what we're restricting ourselves to, comes in a large variety of forms. It can be just a partial palsy to a global palsy and can even end up with a bilateral brachial plexus palsy. So, uh, and these things can look difficult to a student, but the point here is that we need a systematic approach to this examination to get through the exam and even real life to treat these patients. And that is uh, strongly uh, based on a knowledge of our anatomy of the brachial plexus as well as uh, a proper muscle examination. Um, the distal muscle examinations, usually we are more familiar, but uh, examination around the shoulder and the elbow is somewhat more difficult for the PG students. So straight ahead to the anatomy. Um, I'd like to take some time with the anatomy because as uh, again, as a student, I remember that the difficulty in brachial plexus palsy cases was actually revising the anatomy of the brachial plexus. And then, uh, and then uh, as far as I understand, if we grasp the anatomy, the case, is based, uh, the case of brachial plexus palsy is basically uh, an application of other principles of peripheral nerve injuries. So we all know that uh, the brachial plexus is formed uh, from the five roots as the C5 to the T1 roots. And the upper two roots meet to form the upper trunk. The lower two roots meet to form the lower trunk, while the middle C7 continues as the middle trunk. So there are three trunks each of which has an anterior and posterior divisions. So which means that we now have three anterior divisions and three posterior divisions, out of which two anterior divisions, the upper two anterior divisions come together to form the lateral cord. The one remaining anterior division forms the medial cord and all the three posterior cords, uh, posterior divisions come together to form the posterior cord. So it's a useful thing to remember that there are three trunks and then there are three cords. Of course, there are, uh, and each trunk has two divisions in between. So that keep, makes it easier to remember the anatomy of the brachial plexus. There are three trunks, and then we end up in three cords. So from then on, it's actually pretty straightforward because uh, after the uh, cords, we go straight into the branches. And the first branches are coming from the root themselves, which one from the C5 root, which is the dorsal scapula, and one from C5, 6, and 7, which is the long thoracic that goes to the serratus anterior. After the root, the next branch comes in from the suprascapula, that is from the upper trunk. And the others, usually we have these acronyms to remember these for the lateral cord, LML, which is lateral pectoral, the musculocutaneous, and the lateral root of the median. For the posterior cord, we usually remember it as ultra, which is upper and lower subscapula, the thoracodorsal, the radial, and the axillary. And for the... Uh, and for the medial cord, there's actually four medial branches, which is the medial pectoral, the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm and the forearm, the median root of the medial, as well as the peripheral nerve, which is the ulnar nerve. So uh, in all of the branches, I think students are more familiar with, but there's a more proximal ramifications that are more difficult and should be practiced often so that we are comfortable with these at uh, the time of the exam. So 
going ahead, the aim of our examination, what are we trying to find out when you're, uh, when you're doing, uh, when you have a brachial plexus case? One is the extent of the injury. Is it a partial or a complete injury? Do we, what is the level of this injury? Do we have a root uh, level injury or is it more distal in the, dis, in the trunks, division cords, or even just the branches? And maybe even try to find out if there's any change related to time. But of, of course, uh, as Dr. Dhal had pointed out, uh, in an exam, we are only given one chance to examine. So we really would not be able to get into that too much. So the extent of the injury is something that we can think of as the breadth of the injury from C5 to T1, the entire breadth of the brachial plexus, what all is injured and uh, well grossly c5 mostly goes into the shoulder so weakness of the shoulder should especially abduction should signify an injury to the c5 component uh, weakness of elbow flexion should signify a weakness of the c6 component and lack of uh, power and elbow and wrist extension should signify an elbow uh, weakness of the c7 component a weak finger flexion in the c8 and t1 mostly goes into the finger intrinsics the same thing uh, apart from motor when you go into the sensory examination as well, uh, C6 mostly supplies the thumb and part and the index. C7, uh, the middle three fingers overlapping, and C8 goes to the uh, small finger. So in a dermatomal examination with C6, 7, and 8 examination should give us an idea of which uh, components of the brachial plexus are involved. So um, based on this, um, based on the breadth of the injury or the extent of the injury, we usually classify them into multiple uh, common patterns which includes the upper plexus palsy, which is an uh, injury of the C5 and C6 component. And then what is sometimes called the extended upper plexus palsy, which includes the C7 component as well. And then obviously the glo global palsy, which is the entire breadth, which is C5 to T1. Now there is, in, uh, well, we also know that there's a lower plexus palsy, which involves the C8 and T1, but this is clinically very rare. We usually do not see cases where we have weakness of only the hand. Mostly if the hand is weak, we would have some weakness in the proximal part as well. So the uh, isolated lower plexus palsy is a very rare um, situation. So the next point that we're trying to find out is the level of the injury and that we can visualize as along, where is it along the length of each brachial plexus component. And perhaps this is the most important thing that a clinician is trying to find out. So, and uh, the, along the length, is it on the, in the root level? Is it at the trunks? Is it somewhere distal? And out of which we are very interested in finding out whether this uh, lesion is an avulsion or maybe it's a rupture or it's an even further distal injury. So the avulsion and rupture is something that's, again, was confusing to me as a student. So I'll just take some time here to understand the formation of each of these roots. So this is a cervical vertebra, the spinal cord, and we have uh, out of exiting the spinal cord are the dorsal and the ventral rami, and the dorsal rami ramus has the dorsal root ganglion, which is a sensory in nature, and the ventral ramus con con uh, constitutes of the motor fibers. And as they exit the neural foramen, they also give branches to the paraspinal muscles. And that, it is after these branches that it comes out of the neural foramen, and then they form the brachial plexus afterwards. So what we mean by an avulsion is also what is called a preganglionic injury. So this is the dorsal root ganglion, and if the injury is more proximal to it, it has pulled out of the spinal cord itself. That is what's called a preganglionic injury. And diagrammatically, that's what it would look like that the neural foramen is empty and we have the, uh, the roots lying outside. And the trouble with this is the, it's experimental to try and put this back into the spinal cord and the only options for treatment available would be a nerve transfer. But on the other hand, if we have a post gang, sorry, if you have a post ganglionic injury and the rupture is actually distal to these ganglion, uh, for example, as shown diagrammatically here, we have the nerve root coming out of the neural foramen. We find an injury here. We may still be able to graft and get some uh, function out of this root. So what are the findings? Again, I think this is a common question that comes up in an exam is, what are the findings that suggest a preganglionic injury or uh, an avulsion? So uh, I think for first and foremost, that can easily be picked up on an examination is the Horner sign. Uh, and looking at the eyes, that would be a combination of meiosis, ptosis, and anophthalmos. And that comes about because the sympathetic fibers to the eye actually exit the spinal cord after they come from the hypothalamus. They exit at the C8 and T1 root level. And through these roots, and then they enter the sympathetic ganglia at this level. And then they are actually spread to the head along with uh, the sympathetic fibers, which 
travel along the internal carotid and the external carotid arteries. So any injury in the C8 and T1 root avulsion actually breaks these fibers and that would mean that the sympathetic uh, input to the eye is lost and this is, that's what causes the Horner syndrome. And uh, another finding would be an absence of tunnel sign in the supraclavicular region. And from, from early presentations, we understand that the tunnel sign is a sign of a nerve injury uh, and it actually localizes to uh, wherever the nerve is compressed or injured. So uh, if you don't find a tunnel sign in the supraclavicular region, which you, that, can usually means, that can usually mean that the, uh, the injury is an avulsion because then the proximal end is actually within the spinal canal. And then there are other uh, contributory evidence, like the head can be shifted away from the site of injury. There can be atrophy of the paraspinal muscles and the, and the winging of the scapula, as we see on the left side of this patient here. And a very common finding in all preganglionic and or novelgen injuries is severe neuralgic pain that these patients have, uh, which is a deafferentation pain is often considered to be thalamic in origin and it's very difficult to manage. So, a severe pain in the upper limb is also another sign that these patients can have avulsion injuries. So an associated phrenic nerve palsy. The, so the Horner sign actually shows us that there might be an avulsion of the lower roots, while the phrenic palsy, which comes from the C234 level, actually uh, tells us that there might be uh, an avulsion of the upper roots. So uh, I'll skip that because as I said, in a single examination, we'd probably not be able to find out, but a progress of tunnel, if we find any, is a sign that there might be some recovery. Uh, in the history, the patient may offer that they have had complete weakness with some of which has uh, recovered in the time being, and that is a sign that there might be some recovery and should definitely be noted while we're taking this uh, case. So on examination, so from the front, what can we find? So here is a patient who has a scar in the uh, clavicular region and with the other findings to find as well with the posture of the patient, is there a sag in the shoulder levels, Horner sign which would be visible and a characteristic sign of uh, an upper plexus or a global palsy would be the sulcus sign. And the sulcus sign means that this area uh, appears empty. And there's a sulcus which develops between the acromion and the humeral head because the weight of the limb is now pulling the humeral head downwards. And there is no tone of the deltoid. And even the bulk of the deltoid would be decreased because of muscle wasting, which makes this sulcus appear. That's a very cl classical sign that there is a paralysis of the shoulder abductors. So uh, these would be uh, uh, obvious from the front and from the back, again, the level of the shoulders and the atrophy of the muscles, including the paraschinal muscles and even scapular winging. May actually be available, uh, will be maybe uh, observable even at rest. So, with, in a global palsy with avulsion of the roots, again, as I said, uh, there can be a sagging on the involved side. So, this patient, we have a sagging on the left side because it, actually the trapezius is also weak, which means that the shoulder level droops. And from the back, we would be able to find, uh, find the wasting of the paraspinal muscles. And since the paraspinal muscles on one side are not acting, the head is automatically pulled away to the non-injured side by the paraspinal muscles on uh, that side. So uh, in this patient, when we the, the, this appearance straight away suggests to us that the injury should be somewhere here. It should be a preganglionic injury. So and coming to feel or palpation, uh, I think the, uh, for peripheral nerve injuries, the most important part would be checking of sensation, and which would be the easiest way to determine the extent of this injury. So uh, this I've already covered. So checking the dermatomes, coming to understand which parts sensation uh, is not available, gives us a straight away an idea of which parts of the brachial plexus are involved. And tunnel sign, we would have to find the tunnel sign from the supraclavicular region, even distally all the way up to the elbow, to actually uh, to gain an understanding of uh, uh, which level the injury is, depending upon the situation. So. I think the next most difficult thing for all students uh, uh, was always muscle charting and uh, uh, a systematic approach is needed for that. And so some things that may always been called the uh, walk the plexus uh, examination, which is basically nothing much that except that we start at one corner, which is the most proximal corner, most uh, proximal corner and try to make our way downwards uh, along the uh, brachial plexus. And with this would, uh, one thing it ensures that we don't miss anything. The second thing, it ensures that wherever we find abnormalities, we know that from that level onwards is where the injury is going to be. So uh, 
Before we actually examine any of the muscles of the brachial plexus itself, an important muscle to examine will be the trapezius supplied by the spinal accessory because it is a common donor for reconstructions of the brachial plexus and it might be even be used for a, a tendon transfer later. So we need to check the trapezius, which is usually ch checked by a shrugging of the shoulders and we appear uh, uh, and giving resistance, the level of the acromion to make sure that uh, the trapezius is acting and to try and grade trapezius power. So, and then moving on, so uh, as I said, the first branch is the one, the dorsal scapula that comes out of the C5 root and which supplies the rhomboids. They're usually checked by asking the patients to brace their chest while we palpate for the medial border of the scapula. And when, if the rhomboids are acting, the medial border of the scapula should move towards the vertebral line. That is, it should retract. It should move towards the vertebral line. And it is this movement that we are trying to feel. The rhomboids can't be palpated by themselves because they are under the uh, trapezius. So moving on, the next root branch should be the long thoracic. And that's actually pretty straightforward. You just check for retraction of the, uh, of the scapula. The next thing to check for is protraction because the serratus anterior is a protractor of the scapula. And we classically, we check it by asking the patient to pull, uh, push against the wall and look for scapula winging. But the trouble is most patients with brachial plexus palsy would not be able to stabilize their upper limbs to actually push against the wall. And then there are two methods to actually go for it, uh, which is just to try and move the shoulder forwards in a standing position and try to feel whether the middle part of the scapula is now moving forward as well. Or another method would be to support the arm at the level of the elbow and then try to see if the patient is able to move the shoulder forward. So like you can see here, this is a normal uh, individual. So they're able to move the shoulder from this position forwards and we can palpate for the middle part of the scapula. And if that also moves laterally, we know that uh, the serratus anterior must be working. The importance here is that if the serratus anterior is working, but the rest of the upper arm is, is not, we, then we know that at least some part of the roots must be intact and the injury must be distilled to this, which would raise hopes that we should be able to find a route later for repair. So uh, then the next branch, as we said, comes from the upper trunk, which is the suprascapula, which supplies the supraspinatus and infraspinatus. So the supraspinatus, as we see, is a initiator of abduction. Uh, and this, this is not how we usually check it. We check it from uh, an adducted position and try to see if the patient is able to initiate abduction from a completely adducted position. Uh, but a more easier muscle to check usually is infraspinatus, which is an external rotator, which you can check by external rotating with the arms fixed by the side. Uh, moving on, uh, trying to complete all the C5 level muscles here, we would move, move on to the deltoid. And the deltoid uh, is an abductor, which and usually to check, we start from a position of 90 degree abduction and ask the patient to move uh, abduct from there. And this we can actually delineate the anterior and posterior parts by checking this in fl some flexion and some extension as well. Like we can see the posterior deltoid contracting strongly in this picture. And on to the next muscle, which would be the latissimus dorsi, and uh, which is an abduct adductor of the shoulder, but, and we can easily see this, the contour of the muscle in the posterior axillary fold, but this is most easily checked actually by extension in adduction. There are no other muscles which do that. And so if you ask the patient to extend in adduction while feeling in the posterior axillary fold, you should be able to feel the latissimus dorsi contracting. Then we are left with the subscapularis, which is easily checked with a belly press or an internal rotation check uh, test. Uh, once we finish off all of those, we come to the pectoralis major, which has two separate heads, the clavicle and the senocostal. And we can check them separately actually uh, by one is an adduction in the plane of the shoulder, which is towards the opposite shoulder and another is adducting towards the opposite hip or the opposite pocket. And when you're in the plane of the shoulder, we are actually checking for the clavicular part, which is more horizontal. And when you're going towards the opposite hip, we are checking for the sternocostal part, which is more oblique. And we can feel these parts separately to ensure that they are contracting. So uh, finally, we are on to the musculocutaneous, an important branch of the lateral uh, cord. Uh, the important ones would obviously see the biceps, which is easily palpable, is easily visible. But often uh, it is important to note and feel for this muscle why you, because the patient might be able to flex the elbow, but there is no biceps which is acting in this case. The biceps is totally lax. And why is that? That is because uh, they are compensating with you by using the brachioradialis or even the flexor pronator mass. Uh, so it's important to feel for the muscle always when we check for them. And especially in brachial plexus and other peripheral nerve injury, there are a lot of trick movements that patients learn over time and which we should be aware of and be able to uh, deal with them. 
So the peripheral nerve examination, I think they have all been covered. We really need not go into that. Imaging for these cases, when we come to the discussion of this case, X-rays are really only for associated injuries, and MRI. The only issue, importance of the MRI is that it might tell you that there is an avulsion injury. If it is done at least after three weeks or so after the injury, when a pseudomeningocele forms, uh, ultradiagnostic studies. Again, the importance is only to find out whether we, there is an avulsion or a rupture. It takes a very good uh, neurologist to actually tell us whether there are nerve potentials which are recorded in the area which is clinically anesthetic. And when you find that, that actually means that a dorsal root ganglion is intact, and the injury should be proximal to that, which makes it automatically, by definition, that is a uh, that is a uh, preganglionic injury. And then, of course, in situations when you have mixed patterns of recovery, you can uh, have information from the muscles by uh, uh, with ultradiagnostic studies, which give us some more, more early assessment of recovery as well. So, management. Uh, I think currently uh, the opinion is pretty clear that uh, the management is a primary nerve re uh, reconstruction. It is the treatment of choice for all non-recovering palsies. And secondary reconstruction should be ref uh, should be uh, kept only for those who have actually failed primary reconstruction or they have a delayed presentation. So a uh, nerve reconstruction, uh, just to give you a quick understanding, it's now between the choice is usually between a graft or a nerve transfer. And nerve grafting is simply exploring the brachial plexus and grafting the gap in the uh, plexus from connecting the roots to, the, to their distal stumps. That's as for any other peripheral nerve. A nerve transfer is actually using an uninjured nerve and transfer it to a more distal target. So, uh, well, graft is, while it is anatomic, it tries to reconstruct the normal anatomy. A transfer has its advantages that it is an uninjured donor that is used and usually gives faster recovery because we are closer to the muscle that we are trying to uh, renovate. And also because the target is more focused, we are trying to renovate just one muscle rather than a whole entire segment of the nerve. So, uh, for an upper plexus palsy, in a, in a patient, when we find a uh, with a lack of elbow flexion and a lack of shoulder abduction, or at least lack of shoulder stability, what we need to provide are these two movements. And the strategy would be the primary choice for these patients now would be what's called an Oberlons transfer, which is a transfer of a part of the ulna or the median fascicle to the biceps and or the brachialis, depending on um, the status of the ulna and the median nerves. And we can go ahead if tendons are available, especially the pectorals major or the latissimus in the dorsi are available, we can go ahead with these tendon transfers. And the steamless flexoplasty, which is a proximal shift of the flex, common flexural origin, that can be used if we already have an elbow flexion power of at least of grade two. For a completely paralyzed elbow, a steamless flexoplasty is unlikely to give any functional results. 37.5 seconds. So um, a free functioning muscle transfer is then the uh, last choice if none of these are possible. For shoulder abduction, again, a nerve transfer, which is spinal accessory to uh, suprascapula, or a trapezius transfer, or a shoulder arthrodesis as secondary reconstruction options. Uh, just some quick pictures that show the nerve transfer, the spinal accessory to the suprascapula. And uh, this is how an Oberlin's transfer is carried out by the ulnar nerve and the median nerve. We take a fascicle each, they're connected to the biceps branch. This is actually the muscular cutaneous nerve, biceps branch, or the brachialis branch. And that should give us a quick and for good re uh, And they can give good results uh, regarding elbow flexion as well as shoulder abduction. But the trouble with global palsies would be that now we have an added problem of the hand being weak with an asensate hand. And now we have less donors. The median ulnar are also paralyzed. So we cannot use them now for elbow flexion. And these are more difficult uh, choices, uh, more difficult um, uh, things to treat. And the only Option for these are uh, basically an early exploration and the go ahead with uh, nerve transfers. You can, if you find any of the roots like the C5, 6 or 7, they can be used for grafting or else we can use a trans for do a transfer by using the spinal accessory, uh, the phrenic, the intercostal to 2, 3, 4 and 5, they are the common ones used to transfer to the brachial plexus or even what is now up and coming is a contralateral uh, C7 root. So the contralateral C7 root is dissected then it's brought around to the opposite side and then it's connected to the, uh, any of the donors usually is connected to the hand. And hypoglossal was one of the earlier ones is uh, currently out of fashion. So, uh, and when none of this is possible, the only way you could actually get any movement for a completely paralyzed upper limb would be to harvest a, the gracilis muscle along with its nerve and vessel branches, which is the nerve 
supply comes from uh, the anterior division of the obturator nerve and vessel usually from the medial circumflex femoral we harvest the entire muscle uh, and uh, repair the nerve and anastomose the vessels to uh, make sure the muscle stays viable and that can give some elbow flexion if you connect it uh, to the biceps tendon and can even be sometimes used to get some hand function as well um, thank you i'll stop this at that Should we go ahead with the next one? Yeah, Dr. Uh, Ajish, uh, I have taken extra time. Sure. So you can continue with your lecture, but I right. will exit at 6.50 because I have another webinar to conduct by Dr. Dror Pellet. So in my absence, Dr. Shamshul Huda and Dr. Ravi will take over. But try no, to thanks. do it everything in... Uh, I'll try and do it in 5 to 10 minutes, sure. Ah, so I will Quick hand course. over to Dr. Ravi, okay, and Dr. Shamshul. Okay, so the next one is actually on uh, nerve injuries of the lower limb. Sorry. Okay, so um, these are, I think, more, somewhat more uncommon uh, cases to find in an exam. Uh, is again, the nerve injury of the lower limb. Uh, so I just made a quick presentation. I'll try to run through it. And again, I felt the difficulty as a student was that we are not really as familiar with anatomy of the lower limb nerves as we are actually with the upper extremity nerves. We have, we have heard more, we have learned more about the radial, median, and ulnar than we actually ever read about the peroneal and others. So, uh, well, the lower limb nerve supply starts from the lumbar trans lumbosacral plexus. And the only important thing to realize is that the femoral nerve comes from the L234 roots of the lumbar plexus and the obturator from the same but the anterior divisions of these uh, of, uh, from of this plexus and the sacral plexus is what eventually forms the sciatic nerve the common peroneal comes from the posterior divisions the tibial component comes from the anterior divisions and then there are also the superior gluteal and the inferior gluteal nerves that come out of the sacral plexus um, just a quick reminder the uh, femoral nerve is what motors hip flexion by the ilosoas and knee extension from by the cordyceps femoris with root value of L234 and sensation mostly the entire lower limb, uh, anteromedial aspect of the entire lower limb, the thigh, leg, and even the medial foot through the saphenous nerve. So, uh, and then the obturator, not a commonly injured one, but it's possible and it is a nerve of the adductor compartment of the thigh and it supplies the adductors. The sciatic obviously is, uh, I think, a more common injury. And uh, after it exits the greater sciatic notch, it uh, supplies the knee flexor with the hamstrings. And then actually uh, all of the muscles of the ankle and the foot by its common peroneal and the tibial component. So the tibial component is what uh, innovates the uh, triceps suri, the gastrocnemius, and the soleus, and then on to the tibialis posterior and the finger flexors and the intrinsics, etc. The important part here to realize is that the tibial component is what uh, provides sensation to most of the plantar surface of the foot by the middle plantar nerve. And the common peroneal, again, uh, the, the, I think the commonest case to find in an exam would be a common peroneal palsy and a foot drop. And uh, the common peroneal, after it winds around the fibular neck, usually divides into the two superficial and deep peroneal nerves. The superficial is the nerve of the peroneal compartment supplying the peroneus longus and brevis, and the uh, deep peroneal supplies the ankle and two extensors. So uh, what are the causes of lower limb uh, nerve injury? Like for the upper limb, they are usually uh, closer open injuries or crush injuries of the limb. But unlike the upper limb, they are very commonly iatrogenic uh, from injection injury to the uh, sciatic nerve and to even procedural uh, injuries that happen during hip replacement, herniotomy, and other obstetric and pelvic procedures. And then uh, common to other nerve injuries, they can have uh, sharp cut, gunshot, and tumors. But the important here is that uh, lower extremity nerve injuries are actually more common in military practice than there are in civilian practice, because somehow uh, projectile and other injuries tend to cause uh, more uh, injury to these. So uh, coming to the Hydrogenic injuries, it's important to understand that a femoral nerve can be injured in uh, uh, the total hip replacement, but it's more commonly injured during hernia surgery and obstetric procedures. The sciatic nerve, again, uh, to, during a hip replacement or an astabulum fracture fixation, but also during hip arthroscopy. And even if you apply it, there's a predilection for sciatic nerve injury if you apply pre-op traction before hip fracture fixation. 
and others of uh, the common peroneal nerve, which most commonly is injured when we are co correcting the valgus and flexion deformity during a knee replacement. And rarely we can also have saphenous or sural nerve injury from varicose vein surgery. So uh, quick run through for the cases. Uh, the only part, the important part of this history since most of these are either traumatic or they are coming from iatrogenic causes is to uh, take a proper history of the injury as well as what surgery and how they, these were performed. And if the patient is able to give you any history regarding recovery, that has to be recorded as well. And the examination, again, to match that would be uh, to find whether the, uh, the, to delineate the scars uh, of the prior injury or the surgery. Uh, and common to, the, like, uh, co common to other peripheral nerve injuries, muscle atrophy, trophic ulcers, especially in the foot, and then go on to muscle charting. Uh, in presentation, uh, what we would see is that the femoral nerve injuries would present with uh, weak hip flexion and knee extension. Sciatic nerve injuries at the thigh level, which, is a, which basically means that both the components are, in, are involved, should uh, present with a weakness of knee flexion and complete paralysis at the ankle and foot. And if it's isolated common peroneal, that should be a paralysis of the ankle and toe dorsal flexures and foot aversion if the superficial peroneal part is also involved. So uh, I think a, a very common question in examinations is why is the common peroneal more commonly injured than the uh, tibial component? It's not just more commonly injured. It's when both components are injured, it's often more severely affected. And even after a repair, if you repair both the common peroneal tibial component in a sciatic nerve injury, it usually has poor recovery post repair as well. And the classical reasons which have been listed out and which are sometimes asked in the exam would be that uh, one, it is relatively more fixed because it, when it exits a greater sciatic notch and then it winds around the fibular head, uh, it's fixed at these points. So it actually allows only a mobility of about half a centimeter. It's more superficial in the thigh. So any external trauma is more likely to injure the common per uh, peroneal component. The fascicles in the common peroneal uh, nerve are more tightly packed. There is less connective tissue to absorb any compression or any other injury. So they're, they're under reason for it to be more commonly injured. And then what is also said is large fascicle size. The, uh, the fascicular groups of the common peroneal are also larger which means that they are also more common to, uh, prone to compression by uh, Laplace's law, which may, uh, where would, that would mean that with a larger sphere, uh, size sphere, a greater pressure is actually required to maintain the uh, intraluminal uh, pressure. So uh, and that, these are the classical ones is, uh, that have been described for common peroneal, but then there are others which have been uh, also been postulated that the common peroneal actually innovates long thin extensor muscles and that by multiple branches and that need, need coordinated contraction for a functional movement. In contrast, the tibial mainly uh, when it uh, innovates the gastro soleus, it's a large muscle and even if we get some uh, contraction that should be, uh, that should give us a functional result post repair. And then also that the anterior compartment is tighter. So in the situation of a compartment syndrome, we can have the situation where the muscle as well as the nerve is more likely to get damaged from a compartment syndrome. So uh, moving ahead, quickly running through the strategy, I think for all open injuries, whenever they present to us, the treatment that we should offer should be an immediate and early ex exploration. Most of these open injuries would probably be neurotematic injuries and there's no way that they are going to recover spontaneously. So an exam, if you find an open injury, I think it would be safer to straight away uh, offer immediate and early exploration and find the nerve Obviously, plan would be to repair or graft it. If it's a closed injury in the lower limb, especially the sciatic, which comes after surgery, uh, most authors would recommend that we can wait at least four months and even up to six months to see if there is any recovery. If there's no recovery within this time period, we should proceed to nerve exploration that would decompress or repair a graft as would be needed. So, just, uh, so this would be an open injury presented late. So we would end up with exploring it. They all usually need a very large incision because the muscle bulbs are larger. You need a large incision to find the sciatic nerve. And this was actually, we were able to repair it end to end. But then secondary reconstruction. So again, like I think again, common with all peripheral nerve injuries that is indicated for a delayed presentation or poor recovery post nerve reconstruction. And an interesting, I think, rule to remember for post catheter is what's called McKinnon's rule of 18. And the rationale is pretty simple that uh, has already been uh, described by Dr. Dull. Uh, the motor and plates usually degenerate by one year or by one and a half years, that is by 18 months. So whatever repair uh, we do should reach these motor and plates, the nerve fibers should reach these motor and plates within that time period from injury. 
And so uh, that helps us realize whether we should go for a, a nerve primary reconstruction or should we straight away go to, for a secondary reconstruction? Uh, because if the time since injury in months and the distance to target in inches, uh, which basically we are calculating that we are uh, having a nerve growth potential of about one inch every month. So that should total up to less than 18. If it is already too much delayed, uh, that would mean that there will be really no point in go ahead and going ahead with a, a nerve reconstruction because you would not expect to get any motor function. But for sensory reasons, you may still go ahead, especially for the tibial component, you might still go ahead and explore and try to repair it and get some sensation on the plantar foot. And the goal for all of these secondary reconstruction would achieve a painless, stable weight-bearing limb and as much plantar protective sensation as possible. So I'm not going into details of secondary reconstruction of all the nerves, but just to the common peroneal, where the deficit is an ankle and toe dorsiflexion, and you may have a weakness of foot aversion. If it is an isolated deep peroneal injury, the foot aversion may be spared because the peroneal would be spared. And the donors available then would be usually the most common one is the tibialis posterior. The FDL is sometimes used along with the tibialis posterior. And as we said, if the superficial peroneal nerve is not injured, the peroneal longus is also an available donor. And uh, I think uh, by far the most common one used is a tibialis posterior transfer to the dorsum of the foot and which could be through an introscious membrane route via the introscious membrane uh, at the distal leg level, or it could be circumtibial and subcutaneous around the medial border of the tibia. And then there's a choice of insertion with, uh, to the either middle or lateral cuneiform or correspondingly the second and third metatarsal, or to even tendinous insertion to the EHL and the EDL. Uh, so, uh, well, the, the introscious route is usually credited to Barr, but um, historically Cody Villa put in all the first tendon transfers ever performed were through the introscious route. And Ober later on came up with the circumtibial. This is sometimes as an exam where you expect to hear the answer Ober for circumtibial and Barr for the introscious route. And uh, as far as insertion, as this, as this diagram shows, this uh, planning, uh, the uh, tendon has been delivered anteriorly and then it's taken around under the extensor retinaculum and this plan to be inserted around the second or third metatarsal basis. But you can also have the an insertion to the EHL and EDL, which is trying to balance both inversion and aversion. And it's commonly used in leprosy. It was described by Srinivas, we often call the Srinivasan transfer. And it's commonly uh, used in uh, leprosy patients. So, uh, but before we go in for surgery, uh, like all uh, peripheral nerve injuries, the important part would be to maintain passive range of motion while we're waiting for recovery. So, so we should ensure that there we, we have a passive range of dorsiflexion of at least 10 degrees. Use an ankle foot or orthosis to prevent an equinus contracture and to strengthen the donors, which would be the posterior tibialis posterior in this case, which uh, this uh, strengthening the exercises does not just strengthen the muscle belly. It also helps the patient to identify this muscle later for when we try to train these patients after, uh, during rehabilitation and during physiotherapy. We are able to isolate these muscles and contract them better if you have already taught them that preoperatively. So uh, some pictures of a tibialis posterior transfer, they're courtesy of Dr. Dull and team um, uh, from their paper on early tendon transfers. So this is a tibialis posterior that has been disinserted and uh, been pulled into the distal leg. And there the intraoceous membrane has been exposed uh, between and the level of the distal leg. And the tendon is then delivered to the anterior compartment. Uh, it is then tunneled under the extensor retinaculum and is, you can anchor it onto the bone with either an interference screw or now uh, stronger anchors are now available or even a pull-out suture uh, at the base of the foot. So, and usually after such a transfer, for all lower limb tendon transfers, it's preferable to immobilize the ankle and the foot for uh, six weeks and then uh, slow, uh, start rehabilitation in the form of ankle range of motion and protected weight bearing. So I'll stop at that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ajish. Thank you. Uh, there are a few questions for you, Dr. Ajish. Okay. Yeah, actually, I will be quick just because sure. of the time. Right. Uh, C5 is assessed by shoulder abduction or elbow flexion. I mean, PG is asking which is better or what is the single muscle testing for C5 actually? C5 would be shoulder abduction because elbow flexion is contributed both by C5 and C6 with C6 being more dominant. So shoulder abduction, on the other hand, is more dominantly uh, supplied by C5. If you look at shoulder abduction, it's brought about by supraspinatus and the, uh, and the deltoid. So the supraspinatus is actually 
uh, or purely C5 because it comes from the uh, almost purely C5 because when it comes from the upper trunk. So for that reason, uh, uh, weakness of shoulder abduction would most strongly signify a C5 lesion. Okay, thank you. And then the next question for you. By that time, can you stop sharing the screen? Oh sure. Yes. Uh, the next question is for brachial plexus palsy. Can we do distal muscle transfers or neurodigestion? Which is better? Uh, for incomplete palsies, yes, you would be able to do a. If some donors are available, we would be able to do a distal muscle transfer. Uh, but as far as which is better is concerned, as long as the patient is presented to you on time, and neurotization definitely would be better. Uh, in the sense that, that I think this has already been covered by uh, Dr. Dhalser as well. Yeah. That that gives more independent movement when the muscles are re-innervated as compared to doing a tendon transfer. And then we also have to remember when you're doing a tendon transfer, you've actually also decreased some power in that aspect where the tendon has been used. So if you're using F FCU uh, for some tendon transfer, we actually decrease some power in this flexion as well. So as long as you're able to not use the FCU and give uh, some power by neurotization, that will certainly be better. But this is all uh, within the caveat that the, the patient should present uh, early enough that the neurotization should be possible. If that is not possible, then obviously we'd have to go ahead with a tender okay. transfer. Thank you. Next question for you also. Uh, how to differentiate between foot drop due to long standing CPN palsy with joint contractures and stiffness and an equinus deformity due to other neuromuscular condition? Okay, so uh, uh, one of the, I think uh, there are a lot of different things to do, but one very yeah, straightforward uh, test would be sensation. Because if it is a CPN palsy, we should expect loss of sensation on the dorsum of the foot. And if it's other joint and other contractures, we really don't expect that there should be any loss of sensation along the dorsum of the foot or the CPN area. Uh, yes, we can have a confusion because there can be an equinus contracture yeah. uh, with a common peroneal uh, injury. And we would also have a problem with, uh, if there's a joint contracture, that can also present uh, superficially, it can look the same. But when it is a joint problem, when it is a, a other neuromuscular problem, we don't expect a loss of sensation. The second point would be if we can actually demonstrate that there is aversion present, that could actually mean that the, only the superficial peroneal nerve part is intact. And that could also help us differentiate between these. If there's some aversion present, that could actually mean that the CPN may be intact and it can more likely that we have a joint contracture problem than a nerve problem. Okay. And uh, another question for you from another postgraduate. When should we consider for the ankle arthrodesis in case of foot drop due to CPN palsy? Um, I think ankle arthrodesis should be one of the last options for yeah. a CPN palsy because we would have uh, proper donors available. But in those situations, I guess when uh, there's a long standing contracture, there is a very tight Achilles tendon. Uh, there might be bony changes on an x-ray, there can be a collapse of the tarsus. In those cases, and these are actually more common in leprotic patients. Uh, they may have some uh, pro improper sensation, they can have CPN palsy, they can have some kind of a Charcot arthropathy of the ankle and the subtalar region. So those patients would probably be indi indications for uh, uh, ankle arthrodesis, but otherwise for a, what is an isolated CPN palsy, to go ahead with an ankle arthrodesis should be the last option. Okay, thank you. And uh, another question is for Dal, sir. Uh, sir, one of the postgraduate is asking, sir, could you explain between complete and incomplete nerve injuries how we should uh, assess clinically? Uh, yes, I think uh, it's a very good question. Uh, because uh, as I said, if the patient is presenting to us months later, then the problem occurs that uh, we have to decipher between, is it a recovering lesion? or it was an incomplete lesion to start with. So one of the, one of the uh, telltale signs here would be that if you find that, you know, supposing we take the instance of the radial nerve case that we had taken. In that patient, if we at six months find that the proximal musculature, that means the brachioradialis has started working, though it, is, it may have been a little weak, and maybe a little wrist extension is also coming back. This is a case in which recovery is occurring. On the other hand, if we find that one of the distal muscles has been spared, whereas the proximal muscle is not yet innervated, this means that, say, so take for instance, his EPL was working, is working, but 
the extensor digital communist is not working the wrist extensor is not working then this is clear cut case of an incomplete paralysis to start with i think uh, this is how uh, patients can be deciphered at times it can be difficult but this is in a nutshell what how it can be done thank you sir thank you sir now the, there are no further questions from post graduates uh, sharad sir is there uh, any other question uh, within the doc- panel dr dr ravi can i ask one question yeah dr vinit please go ahead uh i think my question to dr dhal again sir uh, uh, most of the time when we are having the post operative radial nerve injury what is the ideal time for tendon transfer second does the timing of tendon transfer is differing due to, uh, uh, in relation to the mode of injury whether it's a clear cut injury or it is compression injury is not thank you uh, i think this is uh, another very very tricky question and uh if it is a post operative documented radial nerve paralysis uh one needs to be very careful because you must remember that the person who has done the surgery is the qualified orthopedic surgeon he must have taken due care to protect the nerve but in spite of that if the nerve has become paralyzed and this patient has shifted allegiance from the previous surgeon to you the best thing would be do not be in a hurry to explore it is always it is always better to wait and to take this injury as a sort of a injury which has been caused by handling of the nerve or retraction at the time of surgery so it would be better that you wait for for a reasonable period of time and i would say at least about 4 to 5 months you must wait when emg in the in the brachioradialis dialysis at the end of 4 or 5 months again this will be guided by the distance to be traveled but if even at that time there is no recovery then you should first explore the nerve because at time, as dr uh, uh, dabas showed one case there have been some cases where we found that the nerve has been uh sort of it's it's been uh, compressed by the plate so probably the surgeon did not realize that while he was putting the plate the nerve came under the under the plate and it got compressed so in these cases you can extract the nerve you can resect the damaged segment you can graft and tendon transfer should be left as the last procedure if you find that the lesion is not repairable on exploration you can always proceed with the tendon transfer preferably in a different setting we should not try to do too many things in one sitting you can always take the patient into confidence tell him right in the beginning i'll explore the nerve if it is not repairable i'll do a tendon transfer later on uh, i would just like to add uh, something here which is a little recent the concept of an early tendon transfer uh if you are waiting expecting the nerve to recover and the patient needs to get back to work early then instead of giving him a cock up splint for a very long time uh these days work alter has recommended that you do a single tendon transfer taking the pronator teres and transferring it to extensor carpi radialis brevis and do not proceed with the remaining two tendon transfers this way you will be restoring the wrist dorsiflexion very early and the patient these patients can get back to work because their grip strength increase increases phenomenally simply by the ability to place the wrist in dorsiflexion so this can be done uh, simultaneously uh, just while we are waiting for recovery to occur and if recovery occurs then you will not need the remaining two transfers but if there is no recovery you can proceed with a tendon transfers to restore digital and thumb extension thank you sir sir uh, there is one question from dr thank you very much it is sir please no no it was the same question i was asking about internal splintage only sir okay, has answered okay. it okay okay uh, can i ask dr ajish yes sir 
Dr. Ajish, uh, what we consider is in the lower limbs, the nerve recovery after repair is not as good as in the upper limbs. If we have a, say, a, a neurotomysis injury of uh, common peroneal nerve or sciatic nerve, uh, do you think we should go for a repair, wait for a period, and then uh, whether the recovery occurs or not, or we go straight for tendon transfers in these cases? Uh, so again, um... Uh, still say that the primary choice would still be a nerve repair, uh, especially if it is a sciatic a thigh level injury. Uh, because uh, tendon transfer options for these sort of injuries are very limited. Uh, tendon transfers for knee flexion, uh, hardly any that uh, usually work. And for a thigh level sciatic injury, you would expect that the entire ankle and the foot would be paralytic. So a secondary deconstruction basically can only uh, be either bracing or ankle arthrodesis. For these patients. So, uh, for that level injury, certainly the idea would be to go ahead with a nerve repair. And uh, later, maybe uh, depending on the sort of recovery that we have, we can later go in for a, a tendon transfer as well. And I think the largest series on lower limb uh, nerve extremity injuries, and that is very clearly shown that for these level of injuries, that's a Louisiana State University series. And that usually, usually what we find is that the tibial component after repair does recover to a certain extent. And if we actually manage to get good recovery in the post-tibialis posterior or something, we could later use that for some balancing procedure in the foot rather than go ahead for, with an arthrodesis uh, for a thigh-level sciatic injury. But when you go distally, a common peroneal, as you said, a common peroneal in the injury at the fibular neck or distal usually has poorer prognosis than others, but I would still like to repair it first. Uh, and... Uh, like Dr. Dhal said, take the patient to conference, tell him that maybe later we would have to uh, go ahead with a tendon transfer. But to try and do them together has also been tried again. Uh, while we were PGs with Dr. Dhal, we did early tendon transfers for uh, common peroneal nerve injuries as well. And uh, in our sort of settings, when we have patients who want to get back to activity, to get back to work early, that is probably a good option. But uh, for a thigh level sciatic injury, definitely the nerve repair. For a leg and distal common peroneal injury, certainly the nerve repair plus minus tendon transfer. Thank you, Dr. Arish. So I think I would just like to add that uh, when we're dealing with a sciatic nerve injury, we should not forget the sensory loss on the sole. Yes, sir. You know, so nerve repair for a sciatic nerve injury is a definite yes because we want a sensate sole. We cannot go ahead with this tendon transfer leaving the sole asensate. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Vineet. Uh, so to end with, uh, we are really thankful for each faculty member so that uh, as they have spared their valuable time for us. And in the end, I would like to invite Dr. Sharad and Dr. Hitesh to for their vote of thanks. Please. Sharad, sir, please. Thank you, Dr. Ravi. My thanks to the learned faculty comprised by Professor Dhal, Professor Utwal, Dr. Pankaj, Dr. Vineet, and Dr. Ajit for excellent and exhaustive coverage of the complex subject of peripheral nerve injuries. I think it's a great learning for all of us. My special thanks to Dr. Manish, Dr. Shamshal Huda, and Dr. Ashok Shyam from Ortho TV for all, who organized uh, this webinar. And uh, my thanks to the sponsors of the program, the ITS Capital as well. Thank you. Uh, it is, sir. Yeah, I on, of of daily orthopedic, uh, I, on behalf of Daily Orthopedics Association, is obliged that my respected teachers had come to teach their uh, PG students. It was really a noble cause, and I think the, it's a boon for the postgraduates. This uh, lockdown is a boon for postgraduate students, uh, students that they can hear to their favorite teachers. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Uh, Thanks and in the here. last, uh, I would like to just, uh, Dr. Shamshul, can you share the last slide and uh, we can end with that? Yeah, yeah please. I'm doing. This is just for, for our sponsors, just guide us. Yeah, I'd like to thanks on behalf of Watcher TV of the Worlds and uh, GUA, the Zydus Kedla people for this academic grant from the makers of Nicoxia. They have given additional great education grant for us. Thanking again to the makers of Zydus Kedla and Nicoxia. Thanks, Dr. Samshul. So, Dr. Samshul, can we end now? Yeah, please. I'm just uh, ending the live stream. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vineet. Thank you, sir.